Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's just a minute past four o'clock and we're gonna get started here in a second. We have a, a full agenda today and this meeting is scheduled out until seven o'clock p.m. Pacific time. Um, for those of you that uh, don't know me, I'm David Kiros. I'm the manager of the section at CARB that oversees the commercial harbor craft regulation, both the current regulation as well as the proposed amendments effort that we're gonna be discussing today. We have various members of the regulatory team here with us today. We also have several members from our air quality incentive programs here to communicate some information to you all. Um, Bonnie Soriano, the chief of the freight activity branch also joins us and we are going to be getting started here in just a minute. So it looks like there are uh, a pretty steady number of attendees. So to start us off today, I'm going to hand this meeting to Nicholas Taylor, who will introduce the meeting a little bit. And I first just wanted to say that this meeting is going to be recorded. Uh, you'll have a chance to ask questions a couple times during the webinar. And I will uh, now turn it over to you, Nick, to get us started. Thank you, everyone. Great. OK, yeah. Um... Let's go to the next slide, please, David. So yeah, first, uh, I'm Nick Taylor, and uh, we'll take a few moments to get organized here. So just please be aware that this meeting is being recorded and will be publicly posted within the next few days. Uh, if you are not already muted, please mute yourself. If you are on the Zoom platform, you'll be using the mute unmute button at the bottom left of the screen. And if you are on the phone, you'll dial star six to mute or unmute. We do ask all attendees to please remain muted during the presentation. Uh, once you are muted, please check that your screen name has been entered correctly. We ask that you write your first name and then last name, then your affiliation. Uh, you can rename yourself by clicking the option on the top right side of your picture or video. If you need help, please use the chat feature. Uh, that concludes our housekeeping. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I'll be uh, introducing things uh, with some background on what's going on today and uh, why we're here. So next slide. So this is slide four. So to briefly share some background, CARB's Commercial Harborcraft or CHC regulation sets requirements for harborcraft in California. It includes requirements for reporting vessels to CARB uh, using low sulfur fuel and for some vessel categories meeting certain emission standards. The compliance dates in the current regulation run from 2009 to 2022. So at the end of this year, 2022, the current existing Harbourcraft regulation will be considered fully implemented. At the same time, CARB's overall mobile source strategy and other planning documents continue to work towards a reduction in emission from all sectors, including but not limited to marine vessels, on-road vehicles, locomotives, refrigeration units, and others. So at the request of our board for the past several years, our staff uh, has been developing a proposal to amend the Harbourcraft regulation this process involved over 400 meetings, including four series of workshops before today, and has resulted in the proposed amendments released this past September. Many of you joining us here today are likely already familiar with this proposal. However, for those of you who are not, the main element is to expand the emission requirements so that they apply to all vessel categories. Staff are also proposing to tighten the standards themselves in a transition to zero emission for some vessel categories and higher tier cleaner combustion standards for others. Now, the proposed compliance dates to take effect would begin in 2023, run through 2031, and most compliance extensions would expire by 2035. Now, that's the main element the proposal also includes other elements such as new alternative options for compliance requirements for Harbourcraft facility reporting and infrastructure, updates to the diesel fuel requirements, and a number of other changes that are intended to close the gaps and improve public health outcomes. This summary, of course, leaves details out, so we still encourage everyone to review the proposal materials on our website. Uh, there is a link to our website included at the end of these slides. Next slide, please. Uh, 
So this is slide five, the purpose of our webinar today. After these amendments were proposed for public comment in September, our board considered the proposal during their November meeting. During this meeting, our board directed CARB staff to continue to perform outreach before they next consider the proposal. A formal date for the board to vote on the proposal has not been set yet, but we're expecting this to be scheduled to occur in the next couple of months. Today, in response to direction from the board at our November board meeting, we are seeking input from you on how to address the board's direction, uh, discussing questions and concerns, and providing additional information on incentive opportunities. This webinar will become a public record and will be transcribed and we will post the recording on the CHC website. Next slide, please. This is slide six. So our specific agenda today has a few parts. First, our staff that work on the Harbourcraft regulation are being joined by several of our partners from some of our programs to share information about the funding opportunities that are out there for Harbourcraft. These folks will be presenting and talking about options that currently exist today, as well as options that might be made available in the future. Before we move on from that topic, we'll have a good break for your questions about these funding options. Second, staff will then share updates about what's been going on since the November board meeting, how we've been responding to their directions and what we expect to be doing before returning to the board for final consideration. That includes ideas about the compliance extensions, uh, technology and implementation review, zero emission measures and our next steps. And then lastly, uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts as vessel operators on how the implementation of Harbourcraft requirements can improve. For example, what sorts of uh, information could you use from us to communicate regulatory requirements or other information, funding opportunities? And in what format would it be helpful for us to share things? So uh, next slide, please. So I will shortly hand this off to our first presenter from one of our incentive groups. But first, I want to mention an overview of the board's direction on incentive opportunities. Our board directed us to continue outreach, which we have done and are doing today by hosting this webinar on the funding opportunities applicable to the Harbourcraft sector. We will continue to have expanded dialogue with our funding program partners to identify, communicate, and generally maximize the use of funding opportunities while complying with future proposed amendments. And lastly, we will be prioritizing communication with our external partners at local air districts regarding opportunities for them to use funding sources that they administer, such as for the Carl Moyer program. So with that, I'll hand this off to Earl, who will start getting into some of the specific options that are out there. Thanks, Nick. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, again, uh, we're on slide number eight, the funding programs for Harbourcraft. Uh, again, my name is Earl Lambert. I'm a staff air pollution specialist with the Mobile Source Control Division here within CARB. I'm the lead staff for CARB's low carbon transportation funded advanced technology demonstration and pilot projects program. Before I move on to that discussion, I wanted to acknowledge that the draft state budget for fiscal year 2022 and 2023 was posted this last Monday. This is what we call the January budget proposal. This is the governor's starting negotiating position for the stage budget. A lot of you have probably taken a look at it or heard about it in the media recently. We're not talking about the funding from this proposal today. We're only going to go into the detail of the actual budget that was passed this last June. I will say that the, the budget proposal has a significant amount of funding to continue the progress we are making on cleaning the air and improving public health. There are line items in the draft budget, such as over a billion dollars for port infrastructure and goods movement, over a billion dollars for clean trucks, buses, and off-road equipment, and $200 million for emerging opportunities, also called demonstration and pilot projects, with a focus on marine and off-road. One of the major takeaways that I had was there is a significant amount of funding being proposed for ports, marine, and goods movement. I want to reiterate that this is the first proposal for next year's budget and changes changes to these numbers will happen and there is no certainty that CARB will be the agency implementing any of these proposed funds. Mm -hmm. But with that all said, if there is anyone that is interested in being part of the public process, 
uh, to help determine where these funds will be allocated and for what purpose, I encourage you to sign up to the Low Carbon Transportation Listserv Gov Delivery System so you can be updated on meetings and events that surround the public process in developing next year's funding plan. And I'll include at the end of my presentation my contact information if you're interested in participating in that process. So turning back to funds that we have in hand and not the proposal for next year, I want to take a, this moment to briefly identify the roles of each of the next three funding programs that we're going to talk about and how they all work together. First, the current LCT or low carbon transportation funding opportunity that I'm going to discuss is the Advanced Technology Demonstration and Pilot Project Program. The goal of this program is to help develop pre-commercial te technology quicker than would organically happen and accelerate deployment of supporting pilot projects to analyze commercial available, commercially available technologies in large-scale deployments. The goal of pilot project is to collect data on operations such as vehicle or vessel operations and how infrastructure functions under different scenarios. I'll talk about opportunities under this program in a few minutes. The next program listed on this slide is the core program, and Todd will go into much more detail on this program in a few minutes, but for context, CORE is a state-run program focused on deployments of commercialized advanced clean technologies into the off-road space. This program does not have a scrap re requirement because technology is still new and in need of financial incentives to gain a foothold near the marketplace. Typically, off-road projects funded in the Advanced Technology Demonstration and Pilot Projects Program would graduate into CORE once they complete their, their demonstration and proven their technical ability. But these, pro these types of projects are still more expensive than conventional technologies. The Carl Moyer program is the next step in deployments of advanced technology. This is an air district run program. It is a replacement program where older and dirtier vehicles and equipment are scrapped and replaced with newer, cleaner equipment that essentially does the same duty cycle as replaced equipment. Moyer requires technologies to be commercialized, with most projects being performed by companies with long-term support of manufacturers and established dealer networks. Now, like I said, Todd and Anthony will discuss these opportuni the opportunities under their programs in a few minutes, but now I want to turn my attention back to the low-carbon transportation-funded advanced technology demonstration and pilot projects. Can we go? There you go. Thank you. Um, so we're on slide nine low carbon transportation. Low carbon transportation is funded by the GGRF, which is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, and started in fiscal year 2013-2014, supporting CARB's first programs to incentivize the, the deployment of hybrid and zero emission cars and trucks, the Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, or CVRP, and HVIP, or the hybrid and zero emission truck and bus voucher program. These two programs are devoted to on-road vehicles, but have developed an important economic method of reducing the cost of vehicles to end users. Starting in fiscal year 14-15, GGRF funds were brought to bear on advanced technology demonstration and pilot projects. Over the years, funding for low carbon transportation funding for low carbon transportation has grown year to year. The first couple of years was about $200 million per year, then ramping up to about $400 million, now pushing over a billion with the last funding plan approved by a board, which nears an allocation of $1.5 billion. But I do have to point out that that number does include some general fund dollars and not all um, is GGRF, but it has been programmed under low carbon transportation. Most of this funding is allocated to heavy and light duty vehicle voucher programs and equipment programs, equity programs, and demonstration and pilot projects. Over the last seven funding cycles, demo and pilot projects have supported around 35 separate projects, representing about $400 million in state investment, which translates into about three quarters of a billion dollars in total state um, investment from all project partners. Projects funded by the this program spanned the wide range of technologies from zero emission trucks, yard trucks, cargo handling equipment, locomotives, delivery vans, and many other vehicles and off-road equipment types, all benefiting disadvantaged com communities. 
Through the Advanced Technology Demonstration and Pilot Projects, CARB has funded about six projects with marine elements. We've funded two hybrid tugboats, a fuel cell ferry, the sea change, which is just starting its, its sea trials right now, and two IMO tier three compliant ocean going vessels. Next, I'm gonna talk about the opportunities that we have for this year for commercial harbor craft demonstrations. The, okay, so we're on slide 10, current low carbon transportation funding opportunities. CARB's board approved the fiscal year 2021-2022 low carbon transportation funding plan in November of last year. The plan has an allocation of $40 million for advanced technology demonstration and pilot projects. There are five categories that were included in the plan and all five will be funded by the available $40 million. The plan includes a zero emission commercial harbor craft resilient renewable infrastructure project. This project is gonna be focused on resilient on-site renewable power or fuel generation for vessel refueling and recharging. This project will be done in collaboration with the California Energy Commission. We typically require a financial match to be eligible for funding. This project is focused on the infrastructure and not the vessel. However, the vessel can act as the required match for this project. The project will also require data collection and analysis. We expect to start the work group process starting soon and we hope to have the solicitation out by mid-spring. Individuals cannot directly apply for funding under this program. Anybody who is interested in applying would need to team with an eligible applicant, which is either a public entity or an eligible California-based nonprofit to act as an applicant. The whole project team must be assembled at the time of application submission with cost estimates and a reasonable timeline. Other projects in the, in the, the funding plan that was approved in November are focused on ocean going vessels, cargo handling equipment, and zero emission deployments for municipalities. If you wanna be part of the development process for this solicitation that I mentioned, I would encourage you to, to participate in our future work group meetings. Sign on sign onto our listserv for gov delivery notices. And if you have any questions on being part of the process or how to sign up for notifications, you can see my contact information at the end of my section. Next slide, please. This is slide number 11, the compliance schedule for zero emission and advanced technologies. And this slide hi highlights the compliance schedule. The zero emission commercial harbor craft resilient and renewable infrastructure project that we just talked about, that could be the infrastructure for vessels that would be compliant with the schedule. So this really could be a good opportunity for one vessel operator that wants to get out in front of the rest of the pack and demonstrate the feasibility of this, of this technology. Uh, next slide, please. This is slide 12 for more information on LCT. And this slide has my contact information and a link to the low carbon transportation webpage. This is where information about uh, demo and pilot solicitations are housed. I am available for one-on-one -on -one meetings with anybody that is interested in applying for funding under the Advanced Technology Demonstration and Pilot Project, and specifically the Resilient Zero Emission Vessel Charging Project, as well as the other ones uh, that I mentioned. I would also suggest signing on to our listserv. I know I've, I've hit that a couple of times, but it's really important if you wanna be part of the process. Um, so please, you can send me an email if, if you don't know how to uh, sign up for the uh, email listserv, I'll be happy to help you with that process. And that's it for me. And at this point, I would like to pass it off to Todd Sterling to talk about CORE. Todd? Thank you, Earl. Um, my name is Todd Sterling. I'm an air pollution specialist here at uh, CARB. Um, I'm the staff lead for the CORE Incentive Pro Program. And uh, we could skip, here we are, slide 13. Um, the Clean Off-Road Voucher Incentive Project, or CORE, targets zero emission, commercially available, off-road equipment that is yet to achieve a market foothold. CORE accelerates the deployment of cleaner technologies by providing a streamlined process for fleets ready to purchase specific zero emission equipment to receive funding to offset the higher cost of such technologies. 
This year, CORE has $165 million to fund zero emission equipment. In addition to freight movement equipment, the program will expand to heavy duty off-road equipment, for example, construction, agricultural, material handling, and even landscaping equipment. Slide 14, please. Cores for commercially available off-road equipment. These are not demonstration projects like Earl was alluding to earlier, but projects that get zero emission equipment into California. Core is a first come, first serve program. There's no scrappage required and stacking of funds is allowed. In addition, <clears throat> additional funds called plus ups can be added to the voucher amount if the equipment operates in a disadvantaged community or if infrastructure is needed. <clears throat> equipment manufacturers apply to the program with an equipment eligibility application to determine the voucher amount. Equipment manufacturers submit this equipment eligibility application where a voucher may be determined. The, detail, dealers, the dealers play a big role in core voucher process. And, and the dealers even take a quiz to participate. At this time, the board has capped all core projects at $500,000. And we plan to start receiving voucher requests in the summer of 2022, this year. Uh, slide 15, please. We'll be having our first work group meeting on January 18th. Um, if you're interested, sign in up on the low carbon transportation webpage um, Earl was talking about earlier. Uh, for additional information on overall core program, you can reach out to me, uh, Todd Sterling, and here's my email address. If you have specific questions on the core eligibility, equipment eligibility application process, you can contact Matt Daner, and his address is here. Um, we also have a core webpage. Um, we, we partner with CalStart, they're our grantee. Um, this is their webpage. To, uh, there's tons of information to understand the program and uh, so you can understand the pro program better. Um, you can always reach out to me or Matt, we can help you out. Um, I think it's a great program. And uh, with that, I'd like to pass it on to Anthony. Thank you very much. My name is Anthony Poggi. I am a staff, or I'm, I'm the lead staff for the Carl Moyer uh, Marine uh, chapter source category. Um, I'm going to take you through some information about the Carl Moyer and the community air protection programs. So the Carl Moyer program was established in 1998 and it was built from the ground up by the program's namesake, Dr. Carl Moyer, whose picture is on this slide. Funding for this program has historically come from smog abatement and new tire fees. The key concept of the program was to buy cost-effective emission reductions that could be creditable to the state's implementation plan through the replacement of old high polluting engines for cleaner alternatives. Emission reductions are required to be SIP creditable and SIP creditability is made up of four central pillars, which are the keys to Moyer's success. They must be permanent, surplus, quantifiable, and enforceable emission reductions. In short, emission reductions must be earlier than required by any regulations, or the, regula the reductions must go beyond what is required by the regulation. We refer to these as surplus reductions. The program was designed from the start as a partnership between CARB and local air districts. In short, we set the guidelines and provide oversight, whereas the air districts select and fund projects according to local needs. Moyer allocations to each district depend upon the community needs and the pools of applications that are received. Slide 17, please. The Community Air Protection Program focuses on communities facing disproportionate air quality burdens, also known as AB 617 communities. Funding is determined on an annual basis by the legislature. It is administered by air districts in conjunction with the Carl Moyer program. Funds are allocated to air districts based on general principles in the community air protection guidelines. The primary focus is on zero emission technologies and communities selected to participate in the program. There are four general principles that should be followed into the to be followed by the allocation. Consider the original legislative mandated allocation in the first year of funds, which puts 95% of the money in the three largest air districts. The second principle is to consider the selected communities, 
And the third principle is to consider communities that are under consideration for future selection. So that would be communities that are not currently designated as AB 617, but are um, under consideration for the future selection as an AB 617 community. And the last uh, consideration is that they are uh, rural air districts and community and communities must also be taken into account. The community air protection marine requirements are based on the Carl Moyer marine guidelines. However, community air protection offers higher maximum funding percentages than Moyer. So for example, uh, marine marine power can be funded at 95% of the eligible project cost for tier four versus 85% for an equivalent Moyer project. Next slide, please, slide, seven, slide 18. So looking back at the last decade plus of the Carl Moyer funding, it has received between 70 and $94 million annually from fiscal year 2011, 2012 to fiscal year 2020 to 2021. The fiscal year 21, 22 allocation was increased to 247 million and subsequent allocations are 130 million per year. The Community Air Protection Program received, has received 704 million since fiscal year 2017, 2018, and received another 260 million in fiscal year 21, 22. Depending on community needs and the pool of applications received, the air districts decide which eligible source, eligible source categories to fund out of their total Moyer allocation. These funds are not earmarked for specific source categories. Slide 19, please. So this slide shows the annual Moyer and CAP funding by Air District for marine projects since 2018. Since that time, districts have spent over $40 million on marine projects. Funding is categorized by the calendar year of the inspection of the completed project. As expected, the air districts with the highest number of commercial harbor craft, South Coast and Bay Area, are, make up the majority of the funds being spent. Commercial and charter fishing vessels make up about 80% of the funding that you see here, or excuse me, 80% of the total number of projects that you see on this table. Slide 20, please. Thank you. Carl Moyer requires vessels to have at least three years of surplus reductions in order to be eligible for the program. Emission reductions that occur prior to or in the absence of regulatory requirements are considered surplus. Emission reductions that go beyond regulatory requirements may be considered surplus, even if the regulatory deadline has passed. The example shown here illustrates a vessel with a compliance date at the end of 2028 would have to be repowered or replaced and operational with the new equipment by the end of 2025. If this vessel was required to go to tier four, but use Moyer funds to install zero or near zero technology, the surplus reductions and the incentive contract could, could continue after 2028, which is the compliance date. When evaluating marine projects, districts may use a vessel's extended compliance date if that vessel received a compliance extension. The second example shown in this slide is with the vessel is for a vessel with a compliance date of 2026, which applies, the owner applies for Carl Moore funding in early 2025 and notifies the district as part of their application process that they will apply for a compliance extension at their earliest opportunity, which would be 18 months before their compliance date, July 2025. The district may approve the project with the condition that the grant will not be paid unless the vessel and vessel owner receive a compliance extension to 2028. If the extension is granted, the vessel would have to be repowered by the end of 2025 and would have three years of surplus before the 2028 compliance date. Vessel owners who wish to apply for Moyer and compliance extensions must do so at the earliest possible opportunity in order to complete their project early enough to achieve the required surplus period of three years. Slide 21, please. Vessel replacement projects and zero emission technologies are available through Carl Moyer on a case-by-case -case review and approval process. 
If a district chooses to submit such a project for CARB review, they will be evaluated by CARB staff um, to see whether or not that they can proceed. For a replacement, staff will evaluate the necessity of a vessel replacement. Good candidates for replacement include vessels that are incompatible for the proposed new technology or when repower costs exceed the cost for vessel replacement. If a repower is feasible, but the owner, the vessel owner still wishes to replace the vessel, the maximum funding amount will be based on the lower cost of the two options, whether that be the repower or the replacement. Zero emission projects are evaluated in part to determine if the replacement vessel will be able to fully replace the duty cycles of the existing vessel. The proposed vessel's battery capacity, horsepower, charging opportunities throughout the duty cycle, as well as the capabilities of the proposed charging infrastructure are required, that they will be evaluated to, to see if they will allow the zero emission vessel to perform the same duties as the existing vessel. CARB staff will also request examples of the proposed technology's current use in the marine sector to determine the viability and commercial readiness of the technology. So as Earl was talking about earlier funding pilot projects, that's not what Moyer does. Moyer funds projects that, that uh, in which the technology is already in use and has demonstrated commercial viability. Slide 22, please. CARB staff is available to answer questions about the Carl Moyer project, Carl Moyer Marine Project eligibility, policies, procedures, and other questions related to the guidelines and program administration. For specific questions about application processes and project selection, please contact your local air district. Thank you very much. My contact information as, long, as well as my manager is on this slide. Please don't hesitate to reach out for any questions you may have. And I will now pass it on to Melissa Houchin to talk about additional funding opportunities and board direction. Thanks, Anthony. And hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Houchin. I'm an Air Resources Engineer for the Freight Technology section at CARB. I'll be starting on slide 23. Uh, in addition to funding opportunities through the Carl Moyer program, funding may be available through other programs. The Volkswagen Mitigation Trust funding for Harbourcraft is available for repowering tier two and older ferry and tugboat or towboat engines. There are two categories of funding that apply and are open for solicitation. These funds are for repowers only and cannot pay for any portion of a new vessel. For combustion, freight, and marine engines, there is a $60 million um, in two, sorry, excuse me. There is $60 million in two $30 million installments administered by the South Coast Air Quality Management District for all projects across the state. This program awards up to $1 million per vessel with a 40% cap for non-government projects and can be used to repower to tier four or technology with equivalent or lower NOx emissions. Solicitation has been open since June, 2021, remains first come first served and has approximately $15 million remaining from the first installment. For zero emission freight and marine projects, there is $70 million in two $35 million installments administered by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District for projects all across the state. This program awards up to $2.5 million per vessel with a 75% cap for non-government projects and can be used for repowers to zero emission. The first come first serve solicitation remains open until March 22nd, 2022, or when the first installment funds run out. There is approximately $20 million remaining in the first installment. The second installment of funds for both of these programs are anticipated to be released in late 2022 or early 2023. Other funding opportunities include the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act Program, the Low Carbon Transit Operations Program, the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program, and Prop 1B funds. CARB staff will continue to monitor and develop funding programs and communicate opportunities to stakeholders on our website. I'll now hand it over to Aaron Bali, who will facilitate our first question and answer segment.
Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Aaron Bali and I'm an engineer for the freight technology section here at CARB and I'll be moderating the Q&A session. Just as a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, you may raise your hand and I'll call on you in the order of which you arrive. And if you can leave, you can also leave a question in the comment section. If you dialed in through phone, Nick will be handling the call-ins. Nick, if you'd like, you can explain how you will be identifying uh, callers. Sure, yes. So uh, I'll be calling on folks in groups of phone numbers by the first digit of your area code. Uh, so if multiple callers begin to speak at the same time, I'll ask one of you to go first, but I'll be uh, activating microphones for folks on the phone in a minute. Uh, thank you, Nick. Um, as a reminder, once you are unmuted, you may begin speaking. And I'll be calling people um, first based on the chat uh, questions we have received. And our first comment was from Merlin Kolb of Real Magic Sport Fishing and Charters. And his question says, CARB's proposed regulation for commercial passenger sport fishing and whale watching boats has generated opposition from over 20,000 Californians reflected in a petition and over 3,000 written comments. And at the hearing, nearly 100 Californians expressed concerns, almost all of which were opposition to the regulation as drafted. Did all the concerns expressed have any impact on modifying the proposed harbor craft regulations? And if so, how so? And I will be uh, unmuting you, Merlin, so you may begin speaking if you have any additional questions or comments. Yeah, thank you, Ollie. This is Captain Merlin with Real Magic Sport Fishing out of Bodega Bay. Hi, Merlin. Hi. Uh, yeah, I mean, that is my question, the one that I wrote and submitted in. I do have some follow-ups, but I'd like to let you work on that one first. Well, hi, Merlin, this is David Kiros. I'll take that question. We have a second portion of this webinar where we're gonna talk about our response to the board direction uh, that was not related to funding. So we'll circle back to your question uh, after we get through that content in the second Q&A session. So for the rest of the, the Q&As, we're gonna focus on questions that are related to the funding programs. Carl Moyer, the Clean Operate Equipment Voucher Program, the low carbon transportation program or any of the other programs that Melissa went over at the at the end there. So all of the funding type questions. Funding questions now. Yeah, and then we will pause again at the end and take questions related to the, the program response to board direction. Yeah, uh, no problem. I just uh, I just am trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with my boat because if I install the tier four motors, it will burn. Yeah, thank you for the comment. We we recognize your your concern. Yeah, so Aaron, I, can you go through and Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so back to you Aaron. Uh, can you scan through and and read just the questions that are related to incentive funding or we could switch to those that have raised hands. Uh yes. Let's see. And if you have your hand up now and it's not a funding question, uh, perhaps it'd be best if you just put your hand down for now and we could re-raise it at the time we're taking general questions. Let's see here. So we have a uh, question in the chat from Lauren Dunlap who said, regarding Moyer, awards for CHC before and after these new amendments will be very different. Is it possible to at some point before the board meeting, see a couple of before and after calculations showing the impact of the Moyer grant of the new regulation. And let's see, Lauren, I'm going to unmute you. So if you have any uh, further questions or any um, anything to add to that. Lauren, this is Anthony Poggi, the lead staff for the Carl Moyer Marine. If you don't have anything to add, I can address your question. Um, I will talk to my management about putting out some different, um, some example calculations. Um, the before and after, it does depend on a lot. Um, a, a vessel with a short lead time, let's say with a three year surplus, um, three years of surplus may not be affected um, very much by the change in, um, 
by the change in the guidelines. Um, but vessels with longer lead time, perhaps, you know, our new chapter would, would change the calculations a bit, but I will, um, I will address that with my management and we will try to, to get some information out, um, out to the public. Okay, our next question comes from Jim Lutjohan. I apologize if I mispronounce your name, but his question is, are privately owned or operated passenger vessels eligible for Moyer funds? Is, um, is he on the, uh, is he available to, yes. to speak? Uh, I will unmute him. Yeah. Uh, Jim, Jim, can you hear me? Him. This is Anthony. <laughs> Hi, this is Jim. Hi, Jim. Um, can you tell me what you mean by privately owned and operated? I reside on Catalina Island where our primary passenger service vessels are all privately owned. Um, we have two different operators that connect us to the mainland. And it was my understanding in the previous meeting uh, in November that um, and maybe I misunderstood, but that the funding that was available for the large passenger vessels were limited to um, like the government run ones up in Northern California. Um, I'm not sure what exactly funding you're talking about, but if, if any uh, vessel is performing in a business capacity and is not a pleasure craft or just used for leisure, um, it is, should be eligible for the Carl Moyer program. Now, whether your uh, Air District decides to fund a certain type of vessel or another, I can't speak to that here. I don't want to speak for them, but a private business is, that is private business and government uh, vessels and other types of equipment are funded by Carl Moyer. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next question is from an anonymous attendee who is asking, are marine vessels currently eligible for core? If not, will they be included in the next iteration of the program? Yeah, this is, this is Todd Sterling. Uh, I talked about core, or, core earlier. Um, yes, we're, we're planning on bringing uh, uh, commercial harborcraft into core uh, this round. Like I said in my presentation, uh, we're having our first work group meeting on the 18th. Uh, this kind of kick off the uh, process for this year. Um, love to hear from you. Um, I, ideas on um, different and, and different technologies that can be included into core. So um, if you can attend that meeting, um, you know, reach out to me. Uh, my email address is on there earlier, and we can talk um, by the, on, on the side. But this is just the first meeting of, of several that we'll have to work out. Uh, core and how we want to spend these funds. We have another another anonymous attendee who asks, will there be incentive funding for public entities such as local governments to handle increased numbers of abandoned or surrendered vessels due to non-compliance? Can you, can you repeat that question one more time? I'm sorry, I'm trying, yes. I want to make sure I understand before I try to answer it. Yes, so the question was, will there be incentive funding for public entities such as local governments to handle increased numbers of abandoned or surrendered vessels due to non-compliance? From a Moyer perspective, I can't speak to that. That's, that's not a type of project that, I, that we've done. This is Earl Amberg from CARB. I'll, I'll just jump in really quick. You know, there's there's, Concurrent programs like that in farmland for um, for uh, you know illegal disposal of hazardous waste and such. So that's probably ran through the county. So that would be something that um, is really outside of any of our um, uh, sphere of influence here in, in in CARB incentive team. So I would reach out to your county representative. Uh, we'll be switching to uh, raised hands. So Matt Holmes, I'm unmuting you. If you have any questions, please ask. Yeah, um, 
I, I kind of typed it in the chat too, but basically my question was about Moyer and I was particularly interested in the commercial harbor craft fame. Uh, and if there's any sort of targeting of incentives based on uh, air pollution attribution or non-attainment with the Clean Air Act, I saw a, a uh, table up there that did list the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District and we have the worst air in the entire country and we got it 10 years earlier than everyone else. And so I see millions of dollars going to places like Monterey and Ventura. Uh, and so I'm curious if there's any sort of a appreciation for equity and environmental justice in the Moyer CHC funding formula. So as I said in the presentation, and thank you for your question, we do, Moyer allocations are determined in part by community need and which includes air pollution as well as the CAT program as well is targets areas with undue or more pollution burdens. This table that you're looking at is not all Moyer spending. That's only Marine. And as you might imagine, the San Joaquin Valley doesn't have a lot of harbor craft. So that's why that when you, uh, when you're looking here, you don't, you don't see them on there. So um, I, I, I hope that answers your question there. The, the pollution burden is taken into account um, this table does not represent all source categories. San Joaquin Valley, for instance, would have a very high share of the uh, ag. If I were to put a table with ag equipment, you'd see them um, very significantly represented. Okay, next question is from uh, Mark Roast. If you have a question about any of the incenting fundings, uh, I will unmute you and, and ask. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Yeah, it is about incentive funding. And um, there's a proto, you know, it's in the context of um, both ex existing repower technology, uh, which is unfunded and needs to be funded uh, to get get the uh, prototypes uh, commercial to get the prototype certified uh, so that it can then uh, provide thousands of conversions for the ports. So what we're looking for is money for uh, money for the for the conversions of the class eight trucks that have to be, unless something's been extended, I don't know about, that have to be the, the older ones, 2009 and earlier engine model year, uh, according to CARB, must be uh, updated to 2010 or later and or electric conversion before the end of this year in order to keep, for, for the people who operate them to maintain their livelihoods is they're going to be barred from the ports and the multimodal rail hubs after the end of this year. So we're trying to jam together a, uh, the, the resources necessary to get these um, conversion kits into production. They're already designed, inspect, they need to be brought into production and they can be brought into pretty high volume production if the funding is there. And uh, that will cover the short haul. Short, short, you know, like there's 230 to 300 kilowatt hour lithium battery packs that are already designed for those. And we are working on um, two, two plus kilowatt hours per kilogram batteries and um, 40, and we will be working on 48% efficiency solar thin film. Uh, which means twice the amount of electricity generated in the same area over a truck stop or a, or a yard. So, um, so we're looking for the money for that. We, we need to be able to say to our customers, and we've got one customer who's a, who is an opinion leader in one of the ports. So we need to be able to say to them, yeah, you can um, get this money. Uh, but we're talking about for conversions, not for replacement vehicles. So our conversion, so I, I understand the last page, uh, they said this is for, you know, not for new vehicles, but for the previous three programs that were talked about, um, 
are those are conversions allowable for funding in those and also is there anywhere you can find funding to, for startup funding for the companies that can provide them Well, thank you for the comment. Uh, it sounded like most of your question was pertaining to funding for sources that are not Harbourcraft like trucks. So I don't know if any of our incentive funding groups have information for you. Um, if not, we'll need to circle back with you to get you the right person to answer that question. Yeah, well, we can also do the same conversions for any diesel Harbourcraft that runs essentially the same size engines up to a class eight. And we also have technology, not the conversion guy may probably can do that. We in the battery and solar company also have uh, large scale uh, gearless wind turbine generator design, which can be used as wheel motor. So we can provide high cap or, you know, as, an, as a marine motor too. We can provide very high torque, high power gearless uh, motors to go with our batteries Mark, and solar. Mark, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I think for the interest of time, uh, it may be yeah, a good idea if that you was it. communicate yeah. directly with me, um, since I'm lead okay. staff for Carbs Advanced Technology Demonstration and Pilot Projects, and we can talk about all the, uh, the funding options for on-road vehicles and uh, large-scale projects. All right, so, thank you. I took a picture of your contact info. Great, Mark. Okay, our next, uh, Call, uh, next person with a raised hand is Jared Davis. Jared Davis, I'm uh, unmuting you. You may begin talking. Yeah, okay, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, my name is Jared Davis. Uh, I am a board member of Golden Gate Fishermen's Association, as well as Golden State Salmon Association, and also the owner and operator of a uh, 49 passenger, um, charter boat based out of Sausalito, California. Um, I provide fishing and whale watching trips to the public. Um, I'd, I'd actually like to preface my question with a, a kind of a statement. It's been shown that these tier four engines will not be able to be installed in vessels that are made of fiberglass, wood, and possibly even aluminum. So that, that represents, you know, a vast majority of the charter boats in the state. Um, so my question would be this, is uh, CARB has in uh, leading up to the November meeting concluded that uh, vessel replacement uh, would be possible to be funded by the individual boat owners if those boat owners would simply raise their prices. Um, by no more than $40 per passenger. Um, however, contacting actual shipbuilders and an analysis by a CPA show that prices would have to increase by hundreds of dollars, you know, tripling the price of a one day fishing or whale watching trip. Um, given that CARB did not contact these actual shipbuilders and basically just used values from current vessels. Uh, that can't comply with the equipment mandates, by the way. Will CARB be updating the economic impact to these boat owners? And will CARB reflect the loss of revenue to these boat owners from individuals and families that will no longer be able to afford to access these trips due to the price? Thank you, Jared, for the question. Um, I think the short answer is no, we're not going to be updating the economic analysis because that's not what the board directed us to do. We are going to cover what the board did direct us to do shortly. So if you have your hand raised, please lower your hand if you do not have a question related to the funding programs we just discussed. Um, we'll come back to questions that are related to board direction and updates to the economic cost, the economic impacts of the proposed regulation. Thank you. Okay, um, you can go back to the go back to the chat real quick. We have a question from Christian Stark, who asks, "How does Carl Moyer handle the calculation of surplus years in the gray area before the pending regulations are approved by the board?" 
So the Carl Moyer, Carl Moyer staff have, would direct the districts to run their programs according to the current guidelines until the new regulation is passed by the board. So I have been advising the air districts who administer marine projects that they are obligated to the current guidelines, however, that they should take in any potential compliance dates in the new um, in the new regulation into account. So we don't have, they don't have a project that's slated to go past the future compliance date with the, with whatever that would be for the new technology. Now, if they are working on a project now in, in the recent, let's say in the last year, that 2020, 2021 engine is, will likely not have a compliance date in the immediate future. So there should be some, some project life there before there's any compliance dates that comes into effect. Um, but there is, um, so I've been advising the districts to take the new regulation to account as far as project life, but that they are only obligated to go by what's currently um, the previous, the existing commercial hypercraft regulation. And, and then thereby the, the guidelines, the current Moyer guidelines as well. Uh, thank you very much. I think that answers my question. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah, our next question is from Greg Bombard in the chat. He asks, can you provide us with a guarantee that if we build new vessels to tier four standards that we will be permitted to operate them for their full 20 to 25 year useful life? And after reviewing the governor's new budget, I didn't find anything that provides funding for those of us who are affected by your proposed regulations. We have spoken with core representatives and funding isn't available there either. Please tell us where, where we are going to find funding for such a costly and potentially business killing regulation. And Greg Bombard, I'm gonna unmute you. So uh, you may speak if you have anything else to add. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, that, that's our question. I mean, basically we understand that CARB funding is for repowers. And unfortunately uh, that's not a feasible move for us meaning in, in Catalina Express, the, we would lose over 56% of our passenger complement, which therefore makes it an unfeasible project. And again, we need to try to find some funding that's going to help us get to the fact that the new vessel is going to range around $20 million, and we would have to build six to seven of those vessels to replace the fleet over this run with CARP. So we're looking to try to help support whatever means we have to to get the government to understand that we need some funding for this new regulation. That's our point. And that if we do build a tier four, that we will get some guarantee that as new technology comes along, meaning electric or hydrogen electric or whatever, that this, the new carb four or the tier four vessel would then not be told that it needs to go away and we need to move to the newer technology before we've even got any chance to get the life cycle out of that. Those are my two questions. Well, thank you, Greg, for the comment. Uh, we recognize the challenge that the proposed amendments uh, present, especially as it relates to compliance costs. Uh, as, as you're aware, and as we discussed today, there's some incentive funding opportunities that are for repower. Some are just for zero emission. Some include vessel replacement options. So the extent that those can be maximized for your fleet, uh, we're here to make sure you have all the information you can so that you can take advantage of those opportunities and anything else that comes to be available in the future. On the regulation side, uh, we're gonna discuss shortly that there's gonna be a, a potential technology and implementation review that's gonna look at how the implementation of tier four requirements goes and also the status of zero emission technology. And I'm, going to save the rest of that for later, but I will just point out that the proposed amendments have dates running out through 2031 and compliance extensions would run through 2035. So as proposed under this rulemaking, the requirements would be as proposed, which would be for ferries in your application going from the mainland California to Catalina Island to meet a tier four plus DPF performance standard. And David, will you also be working with uh the governor or whoever to try to 
have him understand the cost effectiveness of this and how we might find funding or he, how he may put together some funding for this if it's as good as we all think it will be for the emissions here in the local basin then hopefully he'll see the benefit to putting dollars towards it Um, that's a good question. I, I think that uh, Bonnie Soriano, uh, the chief of our branch, might have something to say to that. But I, I did want to turn over to Anthony Poggi to add a little bit more detail on the Moyer program, at least on the funding that we have available now. So over to you, Anthony. Thanks, David. So I just wanted to clarify that Moyer can pay for a tier four vessel replacement. Um, we do these projects on a case by case basis. We will try to streamline that process a little bit in the revised guidelines. However, um, like I said, it is something where we ask the, um, just for the integrity of the program, we ask that the district provide us with information to show why a replacement is necessary. Um, and if it's not necessary, then, and the repower would be a cheaper option, then we would pay based on the repower. But if a, if a replacement's necessary, then it's, um, then you would be paid based on the cost of the uh, the replacement costs. So those, I just want to make that clear that vessel replacements are possible through Carl Moyer. Anthony, thank you for that. I, I was always understood that we would not be eligible for a full replacement, but are you going to take into consideration then the feasibility of a repower versus having to build new? Repeat that last part for me, please. Take into account sure. the feasibility of a repower versus building new. Right. If the vessel is not feasible to upgrade to tier four, is that going to be a consideration towards funding a new vessel? Absolutely. So that's what we would, that's, if, a, if the district brings me a case by case for vessel replacement, that's one of the first questions I ask them is why not, not out of, um, not out of any kind of skepticism, just so I have, I have it in my, to present to my management, why is the repower necessary? Okay, the, the new technology is not feasible. Okay, show me why. And then that'll be part of our case-by-case -case determination. But Thank that is a major that. factor, yeah. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. So our next, uh, going back to the raise hands, our next uh, person with the raise hand is Frank Racino. Frank, I'm gonna unmute you and you may ask a question. Okay, you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I, my name is Frank Racino. Um, I have the vessel Lovely Martha. My family's been in business since 1908. <clears throat> That's 113, 114 years now. What I wanna ask, I was looking at the charts and stuff and the money there and I want to, I, it's my legacy to hand down my vessel or my business to my son, who's a fourth generation fisherman. And this uh, is very important to me. I've, I've been researching alternate, uh, you know, hybrid systems and what, uh, what, what else. But the, what I see, I see like a few million dollars there. I mean, just for one boat, you're talking a few million dollars. Like, there's going to be enough money to replace 200 boats. I mean, I, the, the state I hear has $20 billion. I mean, I, I'm just worried about the money. I'm worried about uh, if I approach a hybrid system, is that car in the Carl Moyer thing, like a, a you know electric engine, diesel powered electric or diesel hybrid, or uh, is the, the funding is there for that right now? And they, uh, a replacement of one vessel is gonna cost you over a million bucks, two million, maybe three. I, I was just wondering, will there be more money? So I can speak on the on the Moyer side of things, and if any other uh, incentive um, staff here want to chime in after me, please do. Uh, I did present on the funding slide um, that there is a very large allocation compared to the historical uh, allocations that we received this year. So instead of the seventy to ninety four. We have a, you know, a three and a half, around threefold increase in that funding just for this year, and 130 million dollars from where in subsequent years, uh, community air protection got 260 million in 
this current fiscal year. So while <clears throat> I can't guarantee, like I said in my presentation, what the districts will spend the money on because they select the projects, there is more money than there has ever been. Um, and so that's that's all I can speak to as far as the amount of money um, available in the in the Carl Moyer and CAP programs. And is a hybrid system eligible for that too? A, a hybrid system is eligible on, on a case by case basis. Now, I will say that a, um, a hybrid system, if it's not verified, then it's a little bit harder to like um, to do the calculations on, but it is an eligible project type on a case by case basis. It's explicit in the Carl Moyer guidelines that we, we have that um, as an eligible project type. Well, it's, it's a lot safer and it's a lot cheaper than putting a tier four in there, but it's a lot cheaper than replacing a vessel too. Uh, I, I want to appreciate everything Carl Moore has done. I've used the program several times and, uh, and I'm looking for that to be our salvation in the future. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. I want to thank you for, and keep the money coming, please, because we have no intention of being put out of business by this. Well, I thank you for your feedback. I'm glad you've had a positive experience with the program. Okay, our next um, and our next individual with a raised hand is Jerry Allen. Jerry, I'm going to unmute you and you may ask your question. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, mostly, this is uh, mostly towards Anthony. Uh, on the Carl Moyer program last um, last year, we attended a, a grant funding workshop where we were told that the Moyer program was going to be uh, reduced to a 40% funding per project and a million dollar cap per project. Um, I also heard Melissa mention something on one of the other programs that was a 40%. Uh, funding program. Can you elaborate on that? Because it, it, it really changes the dynamics of trying to get funding and to make it a viable business decision to keep the boats in California, basically. So when you say 40%, thank you for your question. When you say 40%, are you saying 40% of the project costs? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. I am in charge of writing the Marine chapter. I have written no such draft that includes a, a cap of 40 percent um the workshop you went to I, I don't know if that was a district workshop or if that was a carb workshop if it was okay. a district workshop the district may have decided that they will be reducing marine projects to 40 percent it was a poor it was pola and uh long beach and la grants workshop presentation and they covered you know multiple including carl moyer south coast was there um you know, and, and so it, continue on. What about a? It, have you seen any caps, or is it still by you know on, on a million dollar cap or anything, or is it case by case? We don't have a price cap on Moyer. There are three factors that that would dictate your grant. One would be cost effectiveness, and I'll also add for zero emission and hybrid technologies, the cost effectiveness goes from thirty thousand a ton up to a hundred thousand a ton. So it's a three times a higher cost effectiveness. So the cost effectiveness of the project, the cost of your Moyer or the, the amount of Moyer funding cannot exceed your project amount. And then there's also a, the, the chapter itself will set a maximum funding percentage. Um, so there's three factors at work there, but um, I have not, I have not released anything privately or publicly saying a program-wide million dollar cap. We've had plenty of uh, marine projects that were over a million dollars as they so often are. Uh, and nor have I you know, put out any public, anything publicly that says that we will be introducing a statewide 40% um, uh, funding uh, project cost cap on, on Moyer projects. If, if Long Beach and other districts decide to do that, um, that's something that, you know, we could talk to them about as far as trying to figure out their strategy and, and how to strategize going forward, but they do have the ability to, um, run their programs at the funding amounts they see fit, depending on their community's needs and where they want to focus their money. 
Okay, thank you. That answers my questions. You're welcome. Our next person with a raised hand is Jamie Diamond. Jamie, I'm going to uh, unmute you so you may ask your question. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jamie Diamond. I own Stardust Sport Fishing out of Santa Barbara. I also own Santa Barbara Landing. Um, funding is incredibly skewed and inequitable along the California coast. Um, you repeatedly said there's more money now than ever, yet my area in Santa Barbara on slide, I believe it was 19, um, received none, despite they told they were told there was so much coming, they increased their maximums for this last cycle, only to then have to reduce it by almost half. I'm now out of pocket over $100,000 um, in, in my project that I'm doing right now for one engine. The max is $150,000 that we get for one, and I only can do one engine on that. Um, I have another vessel that, that, I mean, other people, most vessels have two engines. Um, there are areas just south of us in Ventura where they get up to $500,000 and there's areas that get $0 they, because they aren't next to a disadvantaged community. So somehow that means their boat is magically able to, to afford all of this. Um, so I'm, I'm very concerned in how funding is gonna get to those that need it um, because it's never gotten there properly. Um, especially right now, like, look, you can see $0 in 2021, Santa Barbara County, that's nuts. Um, so are you guaranteeing, and, and seeing as how you have acknowledged that most of the vessels in my fleet have to be replaced, um, are you guaranteeing funding for all vessels that need to be replaced to comply? Because as of now, there are lots of vessels in areas that get no funding as it is, no grant money. So um, through slide, let's see here, which was that? That was, uh, I don't have the slide number, the funding vessel replacement and zero emission. Um, and, and you've talked about it now, you, your funding replacement, is there a cap on replacement? Because it's, it's a guarantee that my vessels are gonna have to be replaced, they're wooden fiberglass. So um, is, I mean, do I just go and call a shipyard right now and say, hey, I need to order a boat and throw it on the Moyer tab? I mean, because that's pretty much what we're looking at and you're gonna have a log jam of people that have to do that. Um, it, 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 I'd be lucky if we'd be, I, I doubt that in our lifetime, you'd be able to build all the vessels that need to be replaced. So, and that's, that's assuming that everybody got money for it. So I just wanna know how you're gonna magically have all this money to build all these new vessels. Um, yeah, how, where, how are you gonna do this? Hi, Jamie, thank you for your comment. And I, I'm sorry to hear that the Moyer project that you were pursuing didn't end up working out. Uh, the, the Carl Moyer program is available for, in some cases to pay for surplus emissions reductions. It's not a guarantee that that funding would be available for a particular operator or for a particular region. I don't know if Anthony Poggi wants to talk at all about how the legislature has directed how the funding is apportioned between air districts, uh, but we do recognize and in our cost analyses have assumed the full cost of compliance on the operators and that there would be no incentive funding. Um, we did assume near vessel replacement in our cost analysis for the sport fishing sector. Uh, we do recognize that as engines become uh, more available and in more compact footprints, there's an opportunity that perhaps a repower could be possible by the time your compliance date comes. Thanks, David. And I'll just add, like I said, the, the Moyer allocations are dictated by statute, by state law. We don't have, um, we, we are, there's a prescription for how we determine the allocations. As far as how your district treats uh, marine projects, again, the districts have that ability to um, fund marine projects with a cap. I've heard of the cap in, in Santa Barbara before. Um, their board, I would assume, or the district has decided to strategically limit price caps uh, or, or put a price cap in for, for marine projects. So I, I never want to speak on the district's behalf because that's their jurisdiction. Um, I would suggest that 
you know, everybody and including, including you're all here participating in this public process, make sure to participate locally with your districts as well and make them aware of the, of the need of these source categories, especially because districts do like big projects typically. Uh, it gets a, a large chunk of money out the door very quickly. That's typically a positive for them. So I would encourage you to be active locally as well. So I, I actually am, I'm incredibly active locally. Um, the problem is they were told they were gonna be getting quite a bit more money for this last cycle and then wound up getting less than half of what they were told um, overall from whatever the funding sources were, um, which is crazy because all I've been hearing in these presentations is how much money you guys are swimming, like there's swimming in this money to be able to do these things and it didn't happen. So, um, my, my issue is that you're trying to manage something on a state level, but we have to deal, we, the people that actually have to do it, have to deal at a county level. And so for there to be equity and to actually help us help you kind of situation, this really should, you need to change how that the funds are allocated um, and, and either take it out of the county's hands or give it completely to, or give all the counties enough to do what they need to do. Um, because it, it doesn't work right now, even as is, even without everything else going on, there are boats that can't get newer engines because they can't afford it because their areas don't get the funding. So it's, it, you know, even if they, you know, the people that want to, that are trying, and, and, and I'm one of those people trying to, we're, like, we're, we're, we're at tier three, but I mean, it's like trying to make it harder for people to do the right thing. If you want someone to do this, then it reason would be and logic would be that you give them all the tools to be able to do it, set them up for success. And that's not what's happening. So it, it, you need to take a good look on the funding side to set people up for success. I mean, are you able to, 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 to give $5 million for each of these small passenger fishing vessels, because that's what the average uh, cost is gonna be. So it, for replacement, I mean, it, I'm just saying it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't pan out as it is. And, and, and talking to my county, I can do that all I want, but ultimately it, it, it's at the state level because they can only do with allocate what they're given. Well, I appreciate your feedback. And if you wanna follow up with me um, offline about some allocations and I can answer all the questions you might have and maybe direct you to some other funding, um, funding opportunities for you um, that maybe go more directed towards the state instead of to the county, I'd be happy to help you and give you as much information as I can. And the other thing is we're not allowed to stack Moyer funding. So it's like if we got, we, I mean, we get Moyer funding, but then we can't get any other source of funding unless we take out like a loan or something. So there's just, there's a lot of, of ways in which it's, it, and, and the fact that in order to do the Moyer funding, you have, as a person have to pay everything hundred percent up front, and then you get reimbursed, which makes it even more of a burden on the small business owner. I mean, there's so many different things instead of just making this a streamlined process help us help you. I keep saying it, but like, really, like, it, it just feels like, like every time we try and take two steps forward, we're shoved five back. You know, it, it, we're set up for failure here. Like I said, I, um, you know, I'm happy to I'm happy to follow up with you offline and, and, and make sure that you have all the, you know, all the information you need as far as other opportunities if Moyer is not working for you. And I'll also, when I do talk to the districts about marine funding, you know, I'll try to gauge their, um, try to understand their, um, their strategy better, because like you said, there's plenty, there's more demand than there are uh, funds in some places. And, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to, to follow up with you offline about this. And I totally appreciate that and I'll take you up on it, but honestly, at least I get funding. There are so many others that I hope are listening that will take you up on that offer to talk offline. The problem is offline doesn't work for a lot of people, but it's just, there are so many people, this whole process has been so inequitable and, and the process before has been inequitable. So um, I think there needs to be more transparency in funding 
across the state for this program. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Over to you, Aaron. So uh, we'll next we'll be moving to um, phone callers. So Nick, uh, if you'd like to call out the phone callers. Sure, and uh, I've been tracking the number of people coming in and out on phone uh, right now. Uh, I'll call on folks in groups of phone numbers by the first digit of your area code. So if your phone number uh, begins with a one, two, three, four, or five, uh, I have allowed you to speak. So please uh, speak up, unmute yourself by dialing star six and state your name and your affiliation before you begin. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. All right, uh, moving on. If your uh, phone number uh, area code uh, begins with six, seven, eight, nine, or zero, uh, I have unmuted you. Uh, please again, press star six as well to unmute on your end and uh, uh, share if you have any comments or questions. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Uh, we'll circle back ground one more time, uh, but otherwise, uh, back to you, uh, Aaron. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, so, our next, going back to the chat, our next, uh, here, next uh, caller is Mark, Marcus Medak, and he asks, are there any mechanisms in place for allowing Carl Moyer funding when a compliance deadline is changed? by amended regulations. So Mark, um, I don't know if you're still on the on the phone here, um, but or if you're muted, but when you say amended regulations, um, once a regulation would be a, if, if it was amended, um, like I like I mentioned earlier, the guidelines and the districts are instructed to follow the current guidelines until the commercial harbor craft amendments are finalized and what which is scheduled for for March I believe so until that date where they pass the districts are operating under the current guidelines now I like I said have advised them to take into account proposed compliance dates in the current draft of the regulation and uh, keep an eye on those when they are when they are processing applications and deciding to write incentive contracts so that we can avoid a situation where someone who's eligible for Moyer and they they say, okay, well, let's fund them with a, let's extend their, or excuse me, let's make their contract with Moyer end in 2027. And it turns out that the new regulation has a compliance date in 2025. That's a situation where no one would have done anything wrong under the current guidelines, but you'd end up with a active Moyer contract, which in which the funded equipment would have to be uh, retrofitted or, or replaced. So I, I have been advising the districts to keep an eye on the new regulation when they're determining how long they're issuing incentive contracts. But until the regulation is finalized, the districts are operating under current guidelines. Can you hear me? I'm here. Yep. Yep. So no, my question was more like to comply with the surplus time. So if somebody, for example, now had an application in, um, uh, but they had tier zero equipment, if they put it in and then this uh, proposed Harbourcraft rule goes through, they're not going to be able to get the three years of surplus because the compliance date would be, I think, what, 2023, I think? So, so I guess my question is, when you put this in, you're going to knock, you know, there's going to be uh, a lot of parts or, you know, there, there'll be a lot of uh, operations that would no longer be eligible for funding that would have been 
otherwise, is there any way that, uh, you know, it, are there any mechanisms available at all or are you just out of luck if uh, you hadn't gotten your application in before that compliance date was changed? So the, the three-year the three-year surplus requirement has been something that's been in the marine chapter for as long as I've been aware. The pool of um, the pool of of vessels that will have those short compliance deadlines is something we could consider when we're rewriting the guidelines. I again because of the surplus requirements, it's. I understand what I understand what you're saying is that if your if your compliance state is now if you suddenly have two years of surplus are you eligible the answer under the current guidelines would be no if you were. If you propose a project where you were going beyond what was required by the regulation, then you would be eligible for Carl Moyer we could fund you past your compliance date because you would be going you'd be getting uh, the extra part of early and extra when it comes to when it comes to surplus. Yeah, but as you've heard before, it, it seems like it's going to be pretty darn difficult for us to be able to put in a, a tier four with DPF, for example. Um, and so pretty much if you didn't apply before this year, if this goes through, we're pretty much out of luck in the sport fishing sector from what I could tell. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that from my reading, that, that's what it appears to be. Under current guidelines, if you have less than three years of surplus, you are correct that you you are not you are not eligible for for Moyer funding. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. And Marcus, I just like to add before we go on to the next question that under the regulation, if you get to tier three on your sport fishing vessel by the end of this year, December 31st, 2022 your compliance deadline would be pushed out to December 31st, 2030, before any extensions are considered. So I'm not speaking about Moyer funding availability, but if somehow you're able to get tier three in your vessel, that could be a way to get some extra time to figure out your business plan to get to that tier four plus DPF standard. Right. Um, just wanted That's to highlight it. that for you. Yeah, David, thanks for bringing that up. Um, if, if you were to, you know, a, if you were to have a Carl Moyer vessel uh, a project completed by the end of this year, um, like David said, you would be, um, according to the regulation, if you have a tier three, that does change, that changes the, um, the compliance date. So um, that's another important thing too, to wherever, wherever possible, act as early as possible, whether that's on your own or, or in a, with an incentive program like Moyer. Right. Okay. Back to you, Aaron. And just so everyone knows, we're going to run until 545 on funding questions and then get to the next part of the presentation. We will take a five minute break at 545. So uh, we'll have a chance to take a break and then get back to the presentation. So Aaron, please proceed. Okay. Our next uh, in the comments, our next uh, caller is from Graham Balk. Um, at Green Yachts. His question is, how do vessel operators who are located in an area of California in which the AQMD does not administer marine funds apply to Moyer funds, and how would they apply for core funding? So you're in an area of California. I don't know if you're still on the phone. Um, I apologize for the background noise in my home. Um, you're in an area of California where there's no air district that operates. Um, that operates uh, the Carl Moyer program. Um, I can't speak to core. I'll let the core individual, um, I'll let the core staff reply to that. But I would think that if you're operating in California, you do have an air district, you're in a, a jurisdiction of at least, or of one air district or another. It would just be determining which one. You say AQMD, I don't know if you're referring to South Coast. If you're outside South Coast, perhaps you're in Ventura. Or, or a different uh, air district that would be the one who would um, be perhaps able to uh, take your car and application. Okay, Graham, I did unmute you, so if you have any follow-up, you may ask. 
Yeah, and this is Todd with Core. Uh, Core works um, a lot differently than than Carl Moyer, uh, whereas in, in the Core program we have um, equipment um, and 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 uh, powertrain companies apply for uh, approval and a voucher amount, and you'd work through a dealer to uh, purchase Hello. that powertrain. powertrain. Sorry about that. Hi, Graham, we can hear you. Great. So just simply, I stated it in the chat, um, there are a number of uh, vessel operators around the state of California that uh, exist in a, uh, an AQMD that does not administer marine uh, Moyer funds. How does a vessel operator in an AQMD that does not apply, uh, offer marine Moyer funds access the Moyer fund? And also, will the core funding program be administered? and applied to through the AQMDs or will there be another process? So, so the core funding is not through the districts. The core funding is through the state. Um, I just kind of repeat myself again that the uh, core funds work through a uh, equipment manufacturer. They uh, get a voucher amount, uh, they work, work through a dealer. So you as the vessel owner would go, go through a dealer type network and uh, decide which powertrain uh, would work for your vessel. And Graham, we hope that answers your question. And uh, when we brought the core team on, I'll, I'll just say that I had you in mind and I'm hoping that you can participate in their process so that some of the marine zero emission power systems can be considered for core vouchers. It seems that that could be a, a viable opportunity to get more zero emission vessels out on the water before compliance deadlines and then for the other vessels that don't have compliance deadlines to push towards zero where feasible. So thank you for your comment. Don't know if you have any more. Absolutely, I was planning on following up with Matt and Todd. Um, specifically, what does a, a vessel operator who is, an AQ, is in an AQMD without Marine Moyer funds, how do they access uh, Moyer funding? So like uh, uh, a vessel in Bodega Bay, for example, or Fort Bragg. So if your, if your air district has decided that they do not want to, uh, or and not, they choose that Marine funds, they don't want to spend money on Marine projects, that is their decision. Um, like I said, we uh, we allocate the money based on a based on a various factors, but the air districts choose which source categories they want to fund, and more funding has to go through the air district. Thank you. Okay, our next person in the chat is Jason Koval. He, said, he asks, stakeholders are finding that proposed CARB regulations show little compatibility with state grant and other funding programs, particularly when existing vessels must be replaced due to design and age constraints. How will CARB ensure that support funding is available? This is of particular concern given the aggressive implementation schedule. Uh, this is David. I'll, I'll take that question. Thank you, Jason, for the comment. I, I think that goes back to the statement that incentive funding is available in some cases, but it's not a guarantee. And the cost and economic analyses that we performed assume no incentive funding. Don't know if you have a follow up, but I think that's the only answer we have for you. Uh, yeah, uh, evening. This is Jason. I do have a follow up uh, regard, regarding uh, Moyer funding. Um, we were given some. Uh, insufficient information from our the Bay Area Air Quality Management District about vessel replacement. Uh, so we chose not to apply for a core Carl Moyer fund. Um, since we've started the project, we found out that there is money available on a case by case basis for vessel replacement. But then we were told last week by the Bay Area Quality Management Air Management District that since we started the project, we're not available uh, or we're unable to uh, apply for funding and you know we just 
we find that, you know, it's pretty odd that we were given bad information. And then we find out we have the information, the correct information that we could have applied that we can't apply now. Is there a way to revisit the case by case, Anthony? Um, that would be, the district would have to present me with, uh, you know, the scenario and, and we'd have to look at it again um, with all the information. I don't want to speculate um, right here. Okay. But I'm sorry that there was there was confusion on your end. Okay. Well, we may reach out uh, directly to you then, just okay. to, to to give you our our case. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, back over to you, Aaron. If you could read the next question in the chat or the next person that has their hand raised. Yes, uh, going back to the raised hands, we have uh, David McCloy. David McCloy, I'm unmuting you, so you may ask your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one question uh, with regards to vessel replacements. Um, you discussed the, the, the uh, viability of whether a replacement or a repower is considered for funding. Um, do you look at the vessel's age uh, as as a factor and in that decision, or is it just based on cost? Whether it's a you know three million dollars for a repower or fourteen million dollars for a new vessel, do you, do you also look into the the service life of the vessel in a you know a pretty rigorous environment? Um. You know, I've had a few of these case by cases in which I haven't had to look at the 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 life of the vessel um, because it wasn't really a factor because it was obvious where the replacement was a better option for both the program and and for the vessel owner. Um, it's something I could consider, but it's it, like the process suggests it is a case by case. So if it is a um, if it is a very old vessel and that's part of the reason that a replacement is being uh, suggested or proposed that it, that is something I would I would look at whether or not that's a deciding factor like I said I can't promise until I would have all the information in front of me but um, if a vessel has been in the water and is nearing the end of its useful life um, that would that would be a factor okay understood so we, we just have to be prepared to with surveys and all the right information to just to talk more about that Thanks. Yeah, and I would I would um, encourage everybody listening. If you know that your project type is a case by case basis, um, make sure the district when you present it to the district, make sure that um, the more information you come with, the better, because then there's less back and forth, and it speeds up the process between myself, you, the installer, or the manufacturer, the district. The more information and um, data I have to look at right off the bat or the district has to look at, it really does streamline the process. And um, coming to the district saying, hey, I know this is eligible. Um, is it something you'd like to propose? It's something that I saw CARB made clear in the workshop, uh, the January workshop, that this is um, uh, eligible if I present X, Y, and Z. While I can't promise that the district is going to take your project, I do know that that makes it easier on them if they know that you've already done some of the legwork and have some of the information. Um, so that's just a little bit of advice. Okay, great. Thank you. We're working on that. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, our next person with raised hands is Amber Col Coloso. Uh, apologies if I mispronounced her last name. Uh, I'm unmuting you, so you may speak. Uh, we can't hear you, Amber, if you have a question or not. Oh, hi. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Uh, so the main issue is that uh, for Carl Moyer, since the districts have 
the ability to choose what they want the funding to do. What we really want is that if you're going to use Carmoyer as the funding source for all these uh, repowers and replacements, you should require a certain percentage has to go to marine um, projects because otherwise it'll just go to whatever the districts are concerned about. Like for instance, South Coast right now, they're more concerned about that truck toner or they're going to be using most of their car and wire for, for probably truck replacements or whatever. So it's not going to really go to Marine. And uh, the another concern about replacements is that it's not a lot of the replacements, the cost effectiveness doesn't work out. It's going to be the a lot of these vessels are already tier two or tier three. And if they're going to be trying to, re if they have to replace the vessel to tier four, the amount of emissions reductions isn't enough to, to meet the amount of cost of the, of like a two or $3 million boat. So it's, it's not worth it. So it ends up losing uh, in the competitiveness. So that's why there's all this concern because that's what's happened in the past. Uh, Amber, thank you for the comment. I don't know if any of the funding teams have a, a specific response. Uh, we recognize that uh, some districts don't choose to spend money on marine projects and it's within their purview to decide how that money's allocated. Yeah, but well, if can't you in the next funding, when you issue the funding, can't you rec like have a certain designation like because you're the main source of the funding so you should be able to at least have a percentage like set aside for like like this percentage needs to be used for harbor craft or at least or something like you know at least 10 percent. so at least there's something that will guarantee that there's project and like if at some point like by x amount of time if there's not enough like there's no takers then it can be rolled over to some other project. Amber, so funding is never earmarked. Um, and I'm not sure if that's something that that's a road we would, um, I, can't, I can't commit to, to changing that um, at this current time. Sometimes state reserve funding will be, Moyer State Reserve funding will be focused in one area or another. But um, as of right now, you know, funding, we don't earmark funds for the districts. Okay. But I appreciate your comment on that. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Aaron. Uh, we probably have time for one more question. And then for all the funding questions we didn't get to, we can revisit when we finish the presentation uh, after the next part of the evening here. Okay, um, our next uh, person with a raised hand is Lisa Lavelle. Lisa, um, I'm unmuting you, so uh, please ask your question. Thank you, and I actually uh, put it into the chat as well, just in case, but are there any funds that government entities, uh, let's logo with the city of Avalon, uh, such as cities or nonprofits, can apply for uh, to create public-private partnerships to assist commercial watercraft like the Catalina Express or the Catalina Flyer? Um, which would serve both visitors and also are the primary means of public transportation for residents living in underserved or rural communities. Um, and do any of these apply to retrofits or are they only for new vessels? I know, Anthony, you had mentioned that the Carl Moyer funds with Greg would be actually available on a case by case basis potentially for new vessels um, and or replacements. So the, those that was encouraging to hear that we thought we were going to be excluded from that funding but i know uh, i think melissa had mentioned there was a couple of other opportunities for funding sources and just wanted to confirm what those were so lisa thank you for your comment i can speak for moyer um if there was a um the funding is available um and I'm sorry, your connection was really bad. You were you were wondering if if a public entity or public private partnerships are eligible for Moyer funding. I apologize, your your um, your microphone was 
buzzing pretty bad. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yes, I was wondering if those options are available. I did put the question in the Q&A if you want to read the question there. Um, okay. But just trying to see if that's if there are additional opportunities for funding going through the either government funding route to reach out for funds for anything that you're doing or um, any nonprofits that could apply for funds as well. Well, for the Moyer part of that question, I will follow up with you in the chat. I don't know if any of the other incentive uh, program contacts wanted to chime in at this time. Um, I can, uh, this is Melissa Houchin again. Um, I can just kind of reiterate about um, for the additional funding programs I mentioned, the Volkswagen uh, Mitigation Trust funds are available for um, repowering tier two and older ferries and tugboats. Um, and um, I believe that that should be available for, um, for government projects as well. Um, do you have any follow-up questions on that specifically? Would you be able to just put that slide back up for a moment with that information? I remember that it had some contact information. In yes, um, slide 23 is that slide. And there we do have a fact sheet um, on our website, which is linked down there um, with all the same information, I believe. Thank you. And then the only other question I had regarding uh, the topics this evening um, there are a number of both privately owned golf carts and also golf cart fleets. We were just wondering if golf carts were classified as off-road vehicles as well. Um, it seems that we often run into issues regarding, like, pardon me for going off topic slightly, but regarding golf carts and being able to have them receive funding for cash for punters or any other things like that. I wondered if anybody would be able to speak to some of the funds available for that level of uh, information. Yeah, this is Todd with with a core. Uh, we could talk about off road equipment uh, off offline, not not during this commercial hovercraft uh, meeting. Uh, why don't you give me send me an email or or give me a call? We can we can talk about uh, golf carts. We'll do. Thank you, folks. All of you. Thank you. Okay, this is David. I see there's a ton of questions, but we're going to go on a quick break, five minutes. So it's 5.48 p.m. here in California. So we'll wait it, wait until 5.53 and resume with the presentation and then pick up with questions. Uh, we'll be here at least till seven to finish out. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And we'll be back at 5.53 p.m.
Okay, hi everyone. It's now 5.53, so I'm going to continue on with the rest of the presentation here on slide 25, um, which is the agenda. We're gonna be moving on to the next agenda item, which is uh, discussing board direction from the November hearing, starting with uh, streamlining compliance extensions on slide 26. The proposed amendments currently include five compliance extensions to provide flexibility for circumstances outside of an operator's control, such as delays in manufacturing or infrastructure and feasibility concerns. Extension E3 is a feasibility extension that can provide an additional six to eight years for compliance when retrofits are not technologically feasible and a vessel replacement is not financially feasible. This extension is intended to provide flexibility for operators that have unique operations that present feasibility and financial concerns. At the November hearing, the board directed staff to streamline the extension application process and facilitate the combined use of extensions and funding opportunities for small businesses. Uh, slide 27. <clears throat> To streamline the application process, staff is proposing to allow the use of the 2019 California Maritime Academy study to demonstrate lack of technical feasibility of retrofits, eliminating the need for operators to fund their own feasibility study for the initial extension application. Owners would still need to submit company-specific financial records demonstrating a lack of financial feasibility for purchasing vessel replacements, but the use of the CMA study would decrease the overall cost and time necessary to submit an extension application. Slide 28, please. Uh, we'll now be moving to the next agenda item um, from the board hearing, which is techn uh, technology and implementation review on slide 29. Staff received public comments and board direction to transition to zero emission technology where feasible and to reevaluate zero emission feasibility in the future to avoid missing opportunities to advance technology in the marine sector. Staff is proposing an implementation and technology review beginning every two years in 2023, which would track the advancement of zero emission technology, as well as report on implementation progress of tier four and DPF technology in the marine sector. This will allow staff to reevaluate all technologies and reconsider requirements if technology advancement facilitates more emission reductions. Slide 30. We'll now move to the next agenda item, zero emission contingency measure on slide 31. Board discussion highlighted the importance of attaining air quality standards and including possible contingency measures requiring more zero emission vessels in the future. The current proposal already maximizes the use of zero emission technology that is available and feasible in the marine sector today, and the findings of the proposed te technology and implementation review would inform future regulatory action, including this contingency measure for a more broad zero emission adoption. Slide 32. Uh, we'll now move to next steps for the proposed amendments on slide 33. Staff will continue outreach with operators, the review of public comments submitted, and consider feedback received today, and return to the board for a final vote and consideration in spring 2022. The anticipated effective date of the proposal is January 1st, 2023. Next slide, please. Contact information for program staff is listed on slide 34, as well as our website where you can find more information, fact sheets, and other resources. I'll now hand it over to Aaron to facilitate uh, more questions. All right, thanks, Melissa. Um, as hi everyone, I'm Aaron Bali, and I'll be moderating this Q and A session. Um, as before, we'll rotate between the chat, the raised hands, and the phone callers who Nick will handle and. Uh, we'll start with the raised hands first. Uh, yeah, we'll start with Rick Powers. Rick, I'm unmuting you, and you may ask your question. Okay, I'm here. 
my name is Rick Powers, and I am uh, president of Golden Gate Fishermen's Association. I also also own and operate uh, a couple of charter boats out of Bodega Bay, California. You know, after listening to everybody, you know, speak regarding the issues at hand, um, the Moyer program has been a path which many of our vessels have been able to take over the years, leading us to low emissions. And uh, most of the boats have been able to use it, but it is not uh, a one fits all process. Uh, listening to Jamie speak about her situation down in Santa Barbara and others, um, the Moyer program really isn't the answer for everyone. My question is, you know, as mentioned earlier, in, in your, uh, earlier at the very beginning of this, of this meeting, um, uh, you know, newspapers report that the state is flush with money and that the governor, uh, that Governor Newsom wants to spend two, 22.5 billion over the next five years to fight climate change. Given that CARB's Harbor Craft regulations will remove some sport fishing and whale watching boats from service and destroy our livelihoods how come the governor's budget didn't provide us any economic relief? My main question is, is CARB willing to ask the governor to buy our soon to be non-compliant boats and perhaps provide us grants to buy new ones? You know, such a move would save jobs and save communities that depend on commercial passenger boats to support local tourism. And if not, why not? Hi, Rick. Thank you for the comment. Uh, we recognize that the proposed amendments do have an associated regulatory cost. As CARB staff, we're not able to directly advocate to the governor's office and request funding to help support uh, regulated entities under our regulatory efforts. However, we do undergo significant cost and economic analyses as through the regulatory process. So the standardized regulatory impact assessment went to the Department of Finance. They do work with the governor's office on our budget, on the state of California budget. I also uh, wanna draw your attention to the board member discussion on November 19th, where one of our board members, uh, Hector De La Torre, did talk about talking with some members of the legislature about appropriating funding that would be targeted or directed to Harborcraft. Outside of those efforts, we are not able to really advocate for more funding, but we do recognize there is a cost and it's been disclosed through our regulatory process. So thank you for your comment and uh, we'll take it into consideration. Thank you. Uh, our next caller is Kathleen Keehan. Kathleen, I'm unmuting you so you may ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent, okay, hi. Um, I had some questions about Moyer funding and eligibility and the interaction between that and the extension options that are available. Um, I work in San Diego and we do a lot of uh, repower projects for these uh, uh, charter fishing vessels. Most of them are, are coming up to, uh, moving up to tier three engines. And I understand that there would be, uh, are there tier four engines available for these or would those be part of an extension process? Um, so you, thank you for the question. Um, what I heard you ask was whether tier four engines are available for sport fishing vessels in particular. Uh, there are a number of tier four engines that have been certified. The standards have been in effect by US EPA since as early as 2014. I believe there's 22 models that are certified or were certified before we took the presentation to the board. Uh, we recognize that not all those are the exact power rating for a sport fishing vessel. Also, the other part of the question is, will it fit in the existing vessel? And well, our feasibility study with the California Maritime Academy that we posted in 2019 did show that the wood and fiberglass constructed vessels do have some challenges to be reconfigured. Uh, so there are engines available for sport fishing vessels, but vessel replacement may need to be a compliance outcome until 
more than 22 engines become certified and they're of the smaller footprint that can fit into the existing holes. So let, let us know if that answers your question. It does mostly, but I think my, my concern is um, we have applicants who are right now applying for tier three equipment. Let's say um, that they would qualify for extensions, but we need, I'm uncertain how the timeline works with us getting folks under contract to repower their boats, them applying for extensions to be able to access enough time to get at least three years of surplus under the, under the Moyer program. And at the end of that, let's say they do get through all of those hoops. Um, would they then be required, it sounds to me like they'd be required to go to a tier four plus a DPF by probably around 2030. Am I understanding that correctly? So for the newest tier three engines, the compliance state on sport fishing vessels would be December 31st, 2030. The okay. slide that's up on the screen now shows a couple of examples on how extension can be used to generate extra surplus. Uh, Anthony Poggi might have a little bit to add here, but I'll just start by saying that the, one of the key uh, considerations is that you can only get this extension if it's not feasible to repower. And we're only certain that you can get the extension for two years at a time. So if there's a compliance date, for example, in 2028, or let's go down to the bottom of this screen, if there's a compliance deadline at the end of 2026, so it's the earliest tier two vessel uh, that's in the sport fishing category, the compliance date can be extended to 2028 with that extension. But the submission of the application has to be sent to our regulatory team and it has to be approved. And then the additional processes through the Moyer group have to be satisfied in order to count that as a surplus period starting in 2025. So it'll get you an extra two years uh, to count surplus years from your compliance date. And would you be able to get that extension that early? Or would you have to wait until 2024 for a 2026 compliance date before you could apply for that extension? Excellent question. It has to be at least 18 months before the compliance date for the feasibility extension E3 in our amendment. So everyone has different criteria, but you don't have to wait at least 18 months prior to the compliance date. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you answering my questions. No problem, back to you, Aaron. Okay, our next uh, caller in is Marlin Kolb. Marlin, I'm unmuting you and you can ask your question. Hi, this is Captain Merlin with Real Magic Sport Fishing. The last time I was on, you guys just bounced my question in less than 10 seconds. So can we talk about it now? Yeah, go ahead. Did you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, it was the one that I had submitted under questions. Do you still have that or should I read it for you? Uh, go ahead and repeat your question. Okay. Um, my submission is below. CARB's proposed regulations for commercial passenger sport fishing vessels and whale watching boats have gathered opposition from over 20,000 Californians reflected in a petition and over 3,000 written comments. And at the last hearing, nearly 100 Californians expressed concerns, all of which were opposed to the regulations as drafted. Did those concerns expressed have any impact on modifying the proposed harbor craft regulations? Or, or are you guys gonna steamroll us? And if so, how did they modify your, your recommendations? I, I'm a business owner. This is Merlin Cole with Real Magic Sport Fishing. I've worked my whole life to provide this service to, this, to the residents of California. And these re regulations as written will literally put me out of business. The boat will be removed from service because it will burn with a motor that hasn't even been invented yet. Well, thank you, Merlin, for your patience and waiting to the second uh, part of the presentation. In November, the board directed us to cover four 
items. And one was to touch back, touch base back with the regulated community on incentive opportunities. The other one was to streamline the compliance extension process. The other one was to consider a technology and implementation review. And the fourth one was to look at a zero emission requirement potentially as part of a contingency measure through the state implementation plan process. The, the changes that we're proposing are gonna be addressed through board resolution and they would be to direct us to look at how technology is evolving over time, both on the tier four engine side as well as the zero emission technology side and also to make the compliance extensions more simple, especially for the small businesses. Um, and that's what we're providing information on today and, and taking your comments for consideration. Well, thank you very much for taking the comment. Um, the engines that I have now are tier two and I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of applying for a CARB um, or for a Carl Moyer assistance. And hopefully I can get it done with enough time so that I can keep operating. I plan to apply as soon as possible. Um, but there is no way that a particulate burning filter will, will work in my fiberglass vessel. Aluminum is not an option. It degrades the strength of the aluminum. So if I buy a new vessel, as CARB suggests, they say I'm supposed to sunset my vessel. If I buy a new one and quadruple or quintuple my cost to my customer, you're basically gonna be, gonna be blocking Californians access to the sea because only, you know, we're, I don't operate in Beverly Hills, I operate in Bodega Bay. And people can't pay $700 to go fishing for the day. So they won't go. So access will be blocked. And my boat will be sunsetted per your regulations. And if I bought a new steel boat, if I bought a new steel boat and I put a giant tier four engine in it, the carbon footprint of building the new steel boat and th disposing of my, my current excellent fiberglass boat and then any hours of service additional the delta between my current motors the tons of emission the dirty motors that i have that run very clean by the way the delta between the tier four the steel the carbon footprint of building the boat we'd be be carbon deficit does anybody did anybody ever do the math there would be a carbon deficit if I followed CARB's recommendation to sunset my vessel, buy a new one, raise my prices to five, $600 a seat. You guys are going backwards on this. Thank you for taking my call. Do the math. Thank you for the comment. Okay, our next caller is Will Barrett. Will, I'm unmuting you so you can ask your question. Hi, thank you. I'm Will Barrett with the American Lung Association and very much appreciate the opportunity to ask a question here. Um, certainly we view the, the program as an important public health measure and appreciate uh, you know, the discussion tonight, the robust conversation about the funding opportunities and other elements that you know the board's reacting or the staff is reacting to the board's direction. Um, on the slides um, that were just presented, you know certainly we see the technology assessment as an important component of the implementation phase. We believe really it's important uh, to get as many vessels as possible as quickly as possible to zero emission. I think that tech assessment can can help identify those pathways as quickly as possible. Um, so appreciate that discussion and then. The question I have is really on the issue of compliance extension and uh, the streamlining proposal. Uh, you know, certainly this area of the rule has been a significant concern of ours uh, and really wanted to confirm that the extension process uh, described, you know, as far as relying on the California Maritime uh, study, uh, that would apply only to the initial application for extension rather than kind of an ongoing substitute for vessel analysis. Is that accurate or? Could you clarify that? 
Thanks, Will, for the comment and good question. So our suggestion that we're presenting today is it would be the initial extension, which would be two years. The results of the CMA feasibility study did show that there was no fitment identified to upgrade to tier four or put DPFs on for the commercial passenger fishing and the commercial fishing fleet. So the one of those that's required to go to the tier four plus DPF performance standard would be the commercial passenger fishing fleet. What we're thinking is even though in that study, it was just the, the sport fishing or the commercial passenger fishing fleet that had the feasibility challenges. The reason was because of the difficulty of reconfiguring the wood and or fiberglass holes. So what we want input on is, should we extend that to any vessel that's wood or fiberglass and should it just be the initial two years? Should it be longer? Should it, is two years too much? And do we really need to have vessel specific analyses done to make sure that we're not granting extensions or they're not actually needed? Okay, I appreciate that. And um, I'll just end with uh, saying, I really do feel like it's uh, necessary and urgent that uh, we, we move forward with this rule to establish those public health benefits and get them rolling as quickly as possible. We encourage the staff and board to take action on this uh, really no later than March to make sure that we're moving the process forward. So thank you again, really appreciate this. Yeah, thank you for your comment. Our next caller is David McCloy. David, I'm unmuting you so you can ask your question. Yes, thank you again for uh, taking my question. Um, back to uh, slide 26 and extension E3. Um, I wasn't aware that I was trying to find a, the latest uh, proposal on the amendments. So that, that shows six to eight years. Would that, if a, if a vessel replacement is happening, with say with my group, um, do we need to show any other, it, it, it would be mainly for the ability to have the shipyards complete the project and all the design and all the engineering and completing the projects. That six to eight years would be quite helpful with my group with here at uh, San Francisco Pilots. Would we be able to uh, take advantage of, to, of that extension? I wasn't aware of that one. I was looking more at the uh, one year extensions you were talking before. Yeah, great question. So can the feasibility and compliance extension E3 uh, be applied to your company, which I believe is the San Francisco Bar Pilots? Um, Melissa Houchin, um, I wanted to direct that question to you to see if you're able to respond about the applicability and then also the two requirements that have to be met. Yeah, so um, this extension, um, in order to get this extension, you would need to prove uh, or demonstrate a lack of technological or uh, technical feasibility for the retrofit and uh, financial feasibility, um, lack of financial feasibility for buying a vessel replacement. And so uh, with this uh, idea of streamlining the compliance extensions for the initial application, if uh, the the California Maritime Academy study shows um, that for your type of vessel, um, tier four plus DPF is not feasible, then that satisfies that requirement. And you would just need to submit um, company specific financial information to show um, a lack of financial feasibility to uh, purchase a replacement vessel. And um, this extension, um is for two years and then you would renew it um up to six years or up until 2034 um and possibly up to eight years if um if you have an early compliance state so six to eight years okay. and so it wouldn't be for just the um, logistics of completing such a large project for us with three large vessels it has to be technical and financial feasibility. It can't yes. just because it's really difficult. Correct, yeah, you would want both of those parts that the retrofit is not uh, technologically feasible and that buying a replacement is not financially feasible for your operation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
And I just want to add that both government and private companies are eligible for that extension. So there's no exclusions with, I know you're not government, but there's no governmental exclusions. Thank you. Or private company exclusions. Okay, our next uh, person to the raised hand would be, let's see here, Marcus Mudak. Sorry if I mispronounce your name. Marcus, I'm going to unmute you so you may ask your question. Hello, I, uh, I emailed my questions earlier this morning, but they don't seem to be showing up. So I'll just read them, I guess. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All righty. So I was looking um, in the packet of various information that's on the website there. There's a, a final report that says characterizing activity and emissions of in-use commercial harbor craft. And it explains how you figured out where, uh, you know, in my case, the sport fishing fleet was operating. And it says that AIS data was used in order to characterize the spatiotemporal activity of charter fishing vessels operating out of San Diego Bay. Um, and so I was just wondering, did you guys know that AIS isn't required on charter vessels of less than 65 feet in the San Diego area? Thanks, Marcus, for the question. And I I know that we've discussed this uh, recently with you uh, offline or in a separate meeting. Um, so after that meeting, we're very aware that vessels below 65 okay. feet aren't required to have it. Uh, okay. We are I'm just putting it out there because I haven't seen it addressed anywhere. Also in the same report, it shows this, well, in the same report, it shows, uh, actually I'll, I'll skip this one. I'll, I'll I'll just uh, I'll just say that you guys are aware that that is not a very good way of sampling where the boats are. But I'll go to my next question. And so I was wondering, was there ever any statistical analysis that was conducted to see, you know, because I, I think there were half a dozen charter fishing vessels that were sampled uh, in the state. So I was wondering if there was any statistical analysis conducted to see if the sampled vessels were representative samples of the statewide population of charter fishing vessels was there you know normally when you when you when you when you're going to extrapolate to a larger population i think it's a uh, pretty common when you're sampling a population you have to do a, a statistical analysis to see if your samples are indeed representative samples. Was that done? I, I never saw any evidence of it in that report, but I could have missed it. AIS data was used to determine the fraction of operation of all vessel categories, uh, either within 24 nautical miles or beyond 24 nautical miles. And that remains our use and best understanding of the best available data to make that assumption. Um, going back to your first question, there were a number of vessels, uh, I would say at least a third, if not a half, that were in the sample of sport fishing vessels that were under 65 feet that had AIS data that was considered in the analysis for the 83% of operation within regulated California waters. Yes. But they're not required to have it. On, they're not required to have the AIS on unless they're in a uh, unless they're in a uh, I forget the name of it. But basically, in front of San Diego or in front of uh, LA Harbor or San Francisco Bay. If you're not in a vessel separation scheme, you don't need to have the AIS. So even though you may have it some of the time, it doesn't give you an accurate picture of where that vessel is the whole time. But that wasn't really my question. My question was, you know, if you're only sampling six boats, which is what it showed in the charts there, um, I mean, there are many different types of boats that have very many different types of operating 
parameters. You know, there's some of us that fish the vast majority of the time offshore or down in Mexico. And there's a hand, you know, there are some boats also that spend the entire time fishing inside a bay somewhere, inside San Francisco Bay or San Diego Bay or whatever. But you need to make sure that the samples, the boats that you pick to sample, there should have been a statistical analysis to see if those were actually representative samples. Otherwise, it's just, it's not valid to extrapolate what the rest of that population is doing using that. So that, that was my, that was my question was whether that had been looked at or not to see if those were indeed representative samples. Well, thank you for your comment. Did you have anything else? I did see an email come in from you earlier that had a lot of parts. So no, that, 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 was, that, was, that was a different question. That was a question on, on the Moyer funding. Okay. Um, I do have one more question. It's basically in the same vein here. Once again, going back to the analysis that, was, uh, that you guys did. Um, and so you guys calculated using AAS data that the sport fishing fleet spends or operates 83% of the time within 24 miles of the California coast. If this were to be wrong, if this was incorrect, will the calculations of the contribution of, of NOx and diesel particulate matter from the charter fishing fleet change significantly? So if it's not 83% operation, the quantity of emissions in California from that sector uh, would change in the model. Yes, there's okay. inherent uncertainty with the best available data. So the best available projection could change depending on if the best available input data changed. All right, and, and would the health benefit analysis also change? Yes, the health benefit fit analysis and input to that is the quantity of emissions reductions in each air basin. All right, and how about the economic cost benefit analysis? Would that change too? The valuation of the health benefits is tied to the emissions reductions. And so the total cost and benefits would change. I will point out the cost is around $2 billion. The benefits right now is at $5.25 billion. So we're still, uh, have a lot greater benefits than costs as modeled with best available data. Uh, I think it's arguably best available, but uh, that's, I guess, beside the point. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, back to you, Aaron. Our next speaker uh, is um, Ken Frankie. Ken, I'm unmuting your uh, microphone so you can ask your question. Yeah, good evening, uh, David. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, a couple of items real quick. Um, uh, number one, um, we, we believe uh, I'm representing the Sport Fishing Association of California and emissions reduction is really a high priority. We get it. Um, our ultimate goal is towards that long-term zero emissions, et cetera. So a couple of comments um, to hopefully speed things up or help all of us help each other. Um, with regard to the extensions, um, like to give input. Uh, I would recommend on the commercial passenger sport fishing vessels that the uh, CMA report be accepted as the terms and conditions of the extensions won't change depending on the existence of the equipment and fitment. So uh, uh, that would basically make it a lot more affordable for people to actually continue to apply for the extensions. Second item, you commented about 22 engines that were available. Um, we've been looking hard. We've talked with your staff as well and specific to the commercial passenger sport fishing fleet. Um, we've never found uh, a tier four engine plus DPF that is certified that will fit in a single boat. So we welcome that information uh, if somebody has it. I have had many members ask for it and they've gotten a spreadsheet back from staff with 
merchant ship engines, et cetera. So we could we would definitely welcome that because it keeps getting put out there in the public that there's 22 engines in existence and nobody can seem to find them. So I think that's something that needs to be just to be fair to everybody straight up. If it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. We get it that down the road, we'd like to see it come, uh, but uh, for in the here and now, it doesn't seem to be there. Um, the other thing for Anthony, his comments from Carl Moyer, I think what we're seeing here is a great opportunity for some strategic planning within state government and those local air pollution districts to target the marine side of it. We know there's a couple hundred full-time commercial passenger sport fishing boats in the state. 80 of them have already gone to tier three. Uh, I think the ultimate goal, at least in the here and now, is get the rest of them to tier three quickly. I think some good strategic planning can help get everybody across that finish line. You're looking at about $40 million. So uh, I think some good organization and discussions within staff and those outlying districts might get that done in an efficient manner. And then finally, um, the AIS data, uh, Marcus said it pretty well. Um, so most of the boats don't have AIS. Um, and I get it that that's the best available material that you had at the time. But as an example, the Southern California area, you'd see a lot of straight lines going straight offshore or to Mexico, you know, 10 days at a time or two days at a time, whatever it is. Um, you don't see any of that in the AIS data. So one recommendation would be, frankly, for the commercial passenger sport fishing sector, um, I would eliminate the AIS data as being a data point because it's inaccurate as it's not reflective, but of a tiny portion of the actual fleet. So I know we have a meeting coming up soon. I wanted to have this be on the record, but we look forward to talking with you in person and hopefully work through some of the challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. We look forward to meeting with you all shortly. Okay, so our next speaker is Peter Schrappen. Peter, I'm unmuting your microphone so you may ask a question. Good evening. Hi, David. Can Nick can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Well, thanks. This is Peter Schrapp, and I'm here on behalf of the American Waterways Operators. We're the National Trade Association for the tugboat, towboat, and barge industry, representing the most environmentally friendly and most economical mode of freight transportation. And just wanted to weigh in a little bit on, on a question for you. Um, you know, the $1.6 billion carb, harbor craft rule is scheduled to be finalized in March, and we sent in some comments. Um, but the the, the Harbourcraft rule, it does not provide a technically achievable path to compliance, particularly for, for vessels that would need to be retrofitted to comply. Um, as you know, retrofits are either technically impossible or prohibitively high cost, necessitating an almost complete rebuild and sell off of the existing Harbourcraft fleet. You've heard a lot of, it, a lot of that, um, those comments this evening. The CARBS rule is based on inaccurate vessel population counts. We, we pointed that out time and time again. The emission inventories are inflated. There's a misrepresentation of harbor craft pollution impacts. And I'm gonna just put a little finer point on that. CARBS modeled emissions from harbor craft are as much as four times higher than actual measured emissions from all sources in four major coastal areas. It's not possible that harbor craft alone could produce more emissions than all nearby sources. You know, even a, another specific one that was acknowledged by CARB, uh, that you've, you've refused to address is the fact that you know we've proven under a without a shadow of a doubt that the unreported hours are 2.3 percent not the 29 percent that carb is factored and based on this key number emissions are a fraction of what you have in the model so i'm getting to my question here but um the fact that this model and the data is so inaccurate and there continues to be a willful plotting towards an end result here that's based on faulty data and, and uh, just an atrocious model. Why is CARB staff continuing to move forward without any sort of input from uh, an industry as important as the tugboat, towboat, and barge industry? Thank you. Peter, thank you for your comment. Uh, we 
we strive to use the best available data. We met with the American Waterways operators dating back to May 2018. I think your organization was the first trade group we met with before the first work workshop that we hosted. Uh, regarding that modeling question you brought up, uh, we had met in a direct meeting with your organization and consultant a couple of days ago and have a path forward to, to explain that it appears that your consultant used the wrong data when generating your comment letter. So I think we have a path forward there. The board did not direct us to redo any of our modeling and we're proposing the response to board direction today with these four items. So thank you for your comment. You know, and I guess the fact that just one last question for you then, I mean, it's not more a question, my comment is that unreported hour, the hours though that we pointed out with real time accurate information, David, 2.3% versus 29%, that's outside of the consultant. And we're working with you on that, um, working with our consultant, but really that 2.3 to 29% Delta is, I'm gonna say mind boggling. Um, I don't be too dramatic here, but I, I think that we, <laughs> given the fact that you have not been able to look at the model again, based on this difference, it's time to be dramatic. Comment received, thank you. So our next uh, speaker is Luke Burson. Uh, Luke, I'm going to unmute your microphone so you can ask your question. Hi, Luke, I see you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Yeah, Luke, we still can't hear you. Aaron, why don't we circle back to a different caller and then call on Luke next, just one more time. Okay. And, uh, I recommend we go to the chat as we've been calling on callers and just read through the comments and try to get through some of them. Yes, okay. Um, this next question is from an anonymous attendee who asked the cost of replacing the 92 sport fishing vessels in San Diego would at the estimated given in the Cal Maritime study for per vessel replacement cost total 119 million. Replacement by the same study appears likely. How likely is it funding will be provided to pay for these replacements or will these costs outstrip the ability of these programs to meet that need? I believe that might've been covered before in brief, the incentive funding is not sufficient likely to cover all the regulatory costs, although we're here to maximize operator use of those funds. Uh, we have another question from an anonymous attendee uh, uh, saying renewable diesel requirements appear to be effective in a matter of months. Can you describe what kind of outreach has been done to make the fuel companies aware of this upcoming requirement before enforcing the regulation? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. We, in our analysis for the proposed amendments, determined that there was enough renewable diesel to fuel all the harbor craft around 60 million gallons a year, and it's also available across the state. Uh, our activities right now are focused on returning to the board and responding to their direction, and we're taking input on areas for prioritizing implementation, which would be for the requirements starting January 1st, 2023, if the board does approve. Uh, thank you for emphasizing the importance of that fuel requirement. Okay. Uh... I have here um, Luke Burson's comment to this question pertains to the second part of today's session. When I registered, I was asked if I had a specific question. I submitted a question. Uh, will these omitted questions be following session break? Um, Luke, I just noticed you're on right now. Are you able to speak? Okay, I think I've got this figured out. Okay. You should yeah, be able to hear, hear me you. now? Yeah, we can hear you. 
Okay. First, first question, and it's a simple one. Uh, when I registered, I got an email back that says, do you have any questions? And I believe not only myself, but probably some others submitted questions, but I haven't heard any of those questions offered today. Uh, was that part of the program or has that been eliminated? Uh, thanks, Luke. A number of questions did come in over email and we are gonna prioritize the questions that come in live today and we'll follow up with everyone who's questions came in by email before the meeting that we don't get a chance to circle back to at the end. Okay, so let me ask the question that's most important to me. Uh, first off, I am a fisherman. I'm the president of a local fishing club. I've been doing this for about 60 years and it's a legacy I've passed on to my children and I hope to pass on to my grandchildren. My question is regarding the tier four engines in the boats I fish in today and it centers around safety. And my question is real simple. What role has the Coast Guard played in the process to date? So what's occurred to date by you folks? And specifically in reviewing the draft recommendations, which are moving forward and providing specific feedback regarding these changes and any impact they'll have on passenger safety being me. Thank you. Well, thanks Luke for the question. Uh, safety is a top priority. Um, that, that's first. The Coast Guard is the, and the agency, the organization that oversees safety and inspects vessels. Uh, one example is that our process for undergoing DPF verification requires that the manufacturers comply with all applicable state and federal safety regulations. We've met with the Coast Guard a handful of times over the course of the amendments to tell them what we're proposing to get their feedback. And we continue to work with them to better understand how their safety regulations intersect with our proposed amendments. Uh, I'll accept your answer, but I struggle with it. Uh, from what I understand, that that interaction has been limited and has only occurred when asked by organizations that own boats. And I would have thought you would have started there, not in there, but thank you for your answer. So David, this is Bonnie. I'm gonna address this a little bit. I think, I think that there's been maybe some misunderstanding or mischaracterization about how often we've met with the Coast Guard. We've met with the Coast Guard numerous times. Um, the Coast Guard doesn't always provide input on regulations directly, but, but are always available to talk about um, safety and to educate us on what their safety procedures are. We've met with the Coast Guard, I'm thinking at least 10 times over the course of this regulatory development. The Coast Guard does inspect the vessels. Um, they are they are involved in certain cases in doing in reviewing designs of um of vessel updates and so i just i just want to clarify that we've had quite an intensive um quite intensive discussions with the coast guard we continue to have meetings with the coast guard we've had um, one that I know of since our board hearing. And so I just wanted to kind of re-characterize our interaction with the Coast Guard and the role the Coast Guard plays in, um, in working with us. And I do agree with you and with David that safety is always, um, you know, paramount issue with us. And that's why we do feel just like just like you're saying that it is very important to work with the Coast Guard. So is it fair to say that the Coast Guard is partially responsible for the conclusion that many of the operators of fiberglass and wood vessels will have to decommission them and take them out of service because there would be a safety issue? I'm not sure that that characterization, I mean, what we're finding is it's a fitment issue is that the equipment that's available does not fit in 
the engine compartment of those vessels. They're hard to reconfigure because they are fiberglass and wood. So it's a fitment issue. Of course, you wouldn't want to put any equipment in a vessel that would change its buoyancy or you know, would change its seaworthiness. And, but that stems from, I think the, the finding from CMA is that, they, that this equipment, while it does exist, the equipment's safe. There are tier four engines. DPFs have been used across the board on all sorts of different types of equipment. It's a fitment issue. And, and if something doesn't fit in a vessel, of course, it's, you know, it, it's, it's not going to be the appropriate, um, the appropriate situation for that vessel. And I think that those are the findings that, you know, the study that we that we worked on with CMA found. If there are no further questions, I can now move on to the next. Uh... Um, next comment. Um, this is from Sean A. Bennett, who asked, do, do shipyards, shipyard availability impact the possibility of extensions? We have done tier four repowers on our tugs and it's challenging to find yards with the skills to perform the work. Yeah, thank you for that, that question. Uh, later in the amendment process, but included in the proposal that went out in September, I believe it's extension E5 does include a scheduling extension for shipyard delays if there is a, a challenge with regard to the shipyard. Um, and so Sean, I've, I've unmuted you, so if you have any follow-up. Okay, great. No, <clears throat> that, that's certainly helpful. Just given our specificity of the, you know, uniqueness of our equipment and how many yards are available that can do the work um, on the coast, it's if there are several tugs that are looking to do this at the same time, I think it's it's going to take quite a long time to get them all done. So that's an important um, consideration for us. Thanks. Thank you for the comment. We have this next question from Frank Urusidi. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, yeah, he says in the draft regulation, CARB requires that CHC be retrofitted with tier four engines. The inclusion of these technologies on both to be a major overhaul. These types of systems require support. What effort has CARB done to address the infrastructure necessary to support this equipment? Uh, DEF will be required for the SCR. Um, units and marine fuel terminals will need to carry this product to support the required machinery. Um, I, you have a rather long comment, so Frank, if you want to uh, clear some stuff up, I'll unmute your microphone and you can go ahead and ask. All right, thanks. I appreciate uh, appreciate everybody taking the time for um, for public engagement tonight. Um, a couple of things I know is a long wordy question or comment and I'll, I'll break it down, but I wanted to add something else while, while I'm on here. Um, I, I would really appreciate it. And I think all of us here would appreciate it if staff would stop, just stop stating that there's tier four marinized and certified options available for CPFVs. We all know that it's beyond a fitment issue there isn't something of the displacement or size for CPFVs in the entire state. Dave, we recognize that tier four is out there. We all recognize that. But what you always leave off and what staff always leaves off in front of decision makers, most notably your board, is that marinized and certified tier four is not available for our fleet. We always leave that little caveat off the end. So I just wanted to get that comment out of the way right out of the gate. But in terms of the other, my, my initial comment that I drafted in, in the draft regulation, CARB requires that commercial harbor craft be retrofitted with tier four engines with DPF and SCR. 
tier three with DPF in some limited cases. But the inclusion of these technologies on our boats would be a major overhaul for, for how we operate today. Um, they're gonna require additional support. What efforts has CARB made to address the infrastructure necessary to support this type of equipment? Diesel exhaust fluid will be required for the SCR units and marine fuel terminals will need to carry this product to support this fleet. So the biggest challenge here is gonna be the tankage or storage for diesel exhaust fluid to support a fleet of boats that now have deep, you know, tier four that's dependent upon this type of technology. Um, fuel terminals, as you all know, are located on port tide lands or lease lands from cities and counties. And permitting is gonna be required to provide tankage either above ground or below ground. And it, that, that permission is gonna to have to come from governing bodies. In San Diego, for example, I'll just speak for that because that's where I am. I know space does not exist at current marine fuel terminals and more than likely a coastal development permit will be required to place a tank or to dig for new tanks. Um, what, what engagement have you had with the Coastal Commission with regards to that type of issue? And have you canvassed um, marine fuel terminals to see what their willingness is to support DPF? Uh, or to, to support DEF dispersion or dispensing D, DEF to boats and what they're going to have to go through, what process they're going to have to go to or through with Coastal, and is it worthwhile? I, I just, I, we, we haven't even addressed that yet. Well, Frank, thank you for your, your comments. Uh, I think that the the diesel exhaust fluid to, that is required to effectively reduce NOx emissions in tier four engines. Um, it's required because that's the way they're designed. That's been something that's been rolled out nationwide on on-highway trucks since 2010. There's tens of millions of on-road vehicles that require it. Marine vessels with engines model year 2014 and newer uh, that have been required to meet tier four limits have required to use DEF since then. Uh, so that is a change and uh, we'll acknowledge that, that that will have to be provided at a higher scale for marine vessels due to the turnover to tier four technology. Oh, uh, I thank understand you for that, your Dave. I, I appreciate your answer there. I understand that. I, I've owned several vehicles and I'm very familiar with DPFs and DEF, et cetera. My question is, have we, have we engaged coastal with how we are going to store and dispense DEF. It's a, it's a footprint issue. Most marine fuel terminals, especially here in San Diego, sit it on a limited piece of poor tide lands. And so in order for them to install new tankage to provide DEF, there's gonna be a process. And I'm not quite sure that's gonna fit within your timeline. Yeah, thanks for the comment. We'll take that into consideration. We did meet with the Marine Recreation Association in 2019, and that wasn't raised as a, a concern, and we'll, we'll keep our eyes out for that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next caller is Max Rosenberg. Max, I'm going to uh, unmute your microphone so you may speak. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Max Rosenberg. Uh, I'm with Vane Brothers. We are a tug and barge company whose core business is petroleum transportation. Um, and in LA and Long Beach and many other ports, we're a critical link in the infrastructure chain that, that keeps cargo moving and products on our shelves. So uh, in conjunction with the American Waterways operators, we've pointed out on countless occasions that there are you know, significant flaws in the inventory and subsequent modeling of emissions contributions from regulated towing vessels. Uh, the inventory counts some vessels that don't operate in California at all and overstates the operating hours for many other vessels that call in California infrequently. Modeling suggests that commercial harbor craft contribute more emissions than all sources, including CHC combined. 
a clear impossibility. Uh, CARB has recognized some of our comments and outright dismissed others, but continues to grossly overstate the emissions contribution of CHC, and most critically, you know, uses this falsified data as the core justification for this incredibly costly and wasteful regulation. So CARB data and modeling is misrepresenting the CHC emissions climate to the board and more importantly to the California public to justify incremental gains in emissions reductions uh, for political purposes, I assume, you know, rather than steering efforts and funding for more significant goals. Um, so my question at the, you know, at the risk of kind of repeating other questions that have been asked tonight is, why is CARB staff unwilling to revisit the data and validate the modeling to ensure that emissions contributions from commercial harbor craft are accurately portrayed and appropriately justify the proposed regulation. And, you know, I've, I've heard several times this evening, uh, you know, David in particular use the, the term, you know, best available data. Um, but you've also recognized that there are, there are er errors in your data collection. So, um, you know, why, why are you unwilling to revisit this? Well, thank you, Max, for the, for the comment today. And I also wanna thank you for your engagement uh, with me, with my staff over the last couple of years. Um, your input has been reflected into provisions of the regulation, but I do recognize the proposal that went to our board was a, a tier four plus DPF requirement for the majority of your articulated tug barge fleet. Uh, so with regard to the ATB fleet specifically, um, our staff worked with each of the ATB operators in California to make sure that the exact amount of operating hours in California were included in our data. Uh, we, we took the best available data and really focused on the ATB fleet through the process to our board and our board directed us to look at the four things we're discussing today. So that's where we're focusing our efforts and trying to get input on. Wouldn't it be in, in, in yours and, and the public's best interest for the actual best available da data to be represented and, and used to justify the regulation, you know, rather than, I mean, you've, you've recognized on, you know, uh, on a couple callers this evening that, you know, that there were opportunities for better data. I think this is Bonnie Soriano, and you know we, as as David mentioned, we spoke with you. We've we've spoken with different organizations on data over you know the course of two years, and we continue to get additional data where it's available. And we're you know very thankful to those operators that have provided us additional data. And and in terms of response, you know when you raise concerns about ATBs, we went back and we looked through all that data, just like David, David mentioned. There are places that we get additional data that will go into the next round of updates because these are living documents. They continue, we continue to get better data. In some cases that data comes in after we've frozen the inventory, um, but we're always updating our inventory. I don't I didn't hear staff say that, you know, there are places that there was better data at the time that we incorporated this information into our um, inventory. I, I know my staff is extremely detailed and, um, you know, very proud of going out and looking for the best data that's available at the time. And we incorporate that data into our models, and these are models, they can continually be refined as we get additional data. We will respond to, you know, we met with you a couple of days ago, again, and said that we would go through this data with you to figure out where the discrepancies are. We believe that this is the best model there is based on data available. Will, can we get more data? Yes, we would like to get more data. We will refine it as we get additional data. But at this point, 
we believe that this is based on the best data available, the best model that, that we have at this time. And we will continue to work with stakeholders and, and continue to um, evaluate data as it becomes available and as we have the opportunity to update these models. I mean, the health risk assessment, it takes essentially nine months to complete a health risk assessment. And so at some point we freeze the data, we do the health risk assessment. We've gone back with you about the numbers in the health risk assessment. We stand behind those numbers. We've compared them to, um, to, to ambient levels and found that they're below the ambient levels, far below the ambient levels that, that you're quoting. And so, and so we feel that this, at this point, is a very accurate uh, representation of, of the emissions and a very accurate representation of um, the air quality modeling and health risk assessment. Can you share with us at what point you froze your data so that we can understand when, you know, when the best available data was, you know, was accumulated? Yes, we can do that. And, and as we circle back with you, we made a commitment to circle back with you on two things. One, to talk about the health risk assessment. And the second was to talk about the inventory. And we'd be happy to include that into that meeting. Thank you. OK, uh, next we have two questions from two different anonymous attendees. Uh, first one is, can you tell me what engine manufacturers offer a tier four engine with a DPF as of today? I don't know of any, any especially in the higher horsepower applications like tugboats. And the second one is, what are the penalties for not selling or using the renewable diesel fuel? Again, I'm concerned that local fuel retailers may not be aware of the upcoming requirement if CARB isn't telling them. Yeah, to, to those attendees, those are good questions. So the first one is regarding the, the tier four engine. So in our appendix E to the staff report that is available at the links in the presentation, there's a list of the 22 engine models and manufacturers. Uh, those are tier four engines certified by US EPA. The, the plus, plus DPF component is not available from those manufacturers. And there's extensions in place that separate from the E3 extension of the six to eight years that would allow extensions if those DPFs don't become verified by CARB or certified as part of those tier four engine platforms by the first compliance dates. Uh, then the second question uh, was in regard to, uh, it was something about fuel docks. Aaron, could you repeat it? Yes, yeah, so the question is, what are the penalties for not using or selling renewable diesel fuel? Again, I'm concerned that local fuel re retailers may not be aware of the upcoming requirement if CARB isn't telling them. Okay. The requirement for renewable diesel is for the owners and the operators of the vessel. So there's not a diesel fuel sale requirement on facilities in the proposed regulatory text. The penalties are set in statute and it depends on a, a number of factors, but it, there's a per day violation if an operator of a vessel is not using the correct compliant fuel. Uh, if the proposal is approved by our board and is adopted adopted by CARB and approved by the Office of Administrative Law. Um, so there's a number of questions left. It's seven o'clock. We are going to stay on to get through as many of these questions as we can. If you have your hand raised and you don't have a question anymore, if you can lower it, that would be helpful. Um, otherwise, we'll continue to toggle between the phone, the raised hands, and also the submitted questions in either the chat or the question and answer. So back to you, Aaron. Thank you, David. Um, our next person is uh, Teresa Bowie. Um, I don't know if I pronounced your name right, um, but I'm unmuting your phone so you can speak. Thank you. Hi, this is Teresa Bui with Pacific Environment. We're an environmental nonprofit group. Um, thank you so much for hosting this workshop. It's been very helpful. Just wanted to express our support for the zero emission contingency measures and 
I hope that it applies to the tugboats and ferries. Um, hovercraft are one of the top three cancer causing emissions at ports. And it's clear that we have to move to a zero emission uh, in places like South Coast and the San Diego Air ba Basin to address the acute public health crisis from port pollution. And since the November board hearing, we've seen a number of new vessel projects that have been announced that's zero emission. So we see the frequent technology assessment as very important. Um, and with that, we encourage CARB staff to adopt this rule as soon as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa, for your comment. Okay, our next commenter is Michael Breslin. Michael, I'm unmuting your microphone so you can speak. Yeah, uh, we can't hear you, Michael. I don't know if you've unmuted yourself. I'm sorry about that. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me yeah, now? We can hear you now. Sorry about that. Uh, my name is Mike Russell, and I'm the Director of Safety and Sustainability for American Waterways Operators. I work with Mr. Peter Schrappen, who spoke earlier, and Max, who you just called on, who spoke to the feasibility of this act. Um, I want to echo their sentiments that the, 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 the technology that you're talking about um, simply doesn't exist. It isn't feasible to put into the boats that we have. And also the data that you're relying on doesn't seem to be uh, in line with the, with the uh, peer review data that we, we presented to you as an organization. So my question um, is how does CARB see moving forward with this proposal for tier four, which required diesel exhaust fluid tanks around 5,000 gallons for a 2,000 uh, uh, horsepower engine, 100 cubic feet of space for the, the diesel particulate filters are going to be above those engines. Um, the existing vessel fleet doesn't have the ability to do that. What is your guidance for our operators as they look to see uh, the, the correct uh, path forward to making sure their fleet meets the requirements of your act? Um, thank you, Michael, for the comment. Uh, Feasibility issues will be worked out between a vessel owner operator, their naval architect, and the shipyard to the extent that modifications can't meet the standard. There is a number of compliance extensions that are available if the owner operator uh, qualifies. Thank you. And um, I do want to thank all the, all the fishermen I've heard, all the operators that I've heard on this call. Just, just hearing the engagement and knowing that we have a community that's so um, active with this and is trying to advocate for, for real solutions is, um, is exciting. And I hope that we can, we can work towards a good conclusion. Thank you, Michael, for your comment. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Michael Thompson. Michael, I'm unmuting you. How about now, you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, fine. I got a question and a comment. Um, the question is uh, this E3 exemption out to eight years, uh, but 2035 is still the absolute drop dead date, right? Hi, Michael, um, I can answer that. Yes, um, the extensions are six to eight years with um, a cap at, 20, at the end of 2034. So January 1st, 2035 would be when those extensions would expire. Okay, so you've just, that, that little extra two years, the eight year one is just, just put a little pretty bow on a bone and toss it to us, but it's basically meaningless. Okay, all right, thanks for that. Uh, my comment is, <laughs> I've been involved in fisheries. By the way, I'm the owner of Newport Landing and Davies Locker Sport Fishing and Whale Watching in Newport Beach. I've been involved in fisheries management for the last 20 years, and I can't even tell you how tired I am of government entities crushing people's jobs and livelihoods based on best available science. I am so sick of that term. Uh, 
just the the whole over the, going back to what Marcus Medak and Ken Frankie were saying. You know, there's a lot of overnight boats in the CPFV fleet. I'm going to say probably 40 percent, maybe more. That number those guys would have that travel through regulated waters uh, for an hour or two and then disappear from anywhere for the rest of that day for two, three or longer days. And how you come up with 83% of our time is spent in, regula in regulated waters, I have no idea. And I think that you need to address that before you go any further with this. That's all I have to say. Um, thank you, Michael, for your comment. And to the extent that those vessels are operating an above average amount beyond regulated California waters, there is that low use provision. And for your fleet in Newport Beach, there's there's only a certain part of that harbor that would be within two miles of a disadvantaged community. So it's possible that you would maximize your low use hours, especially if you're in tier three. Uh, we do appreciate your feedback generally, and we'll take it under to consideration. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Scott Merritt. Scott, I'm muting you to speak. Thanks, Aaron. Um, I guess this question is uh, for David and Bonnie, and um, you know I won't reiterate, but I do want to say thanks for staying late and taking the additional question, and thank you for agreeing to meet with. Uh, oh, I guess I should say I represent Foss Maritime and the American Waterway Operators uh, Towing Industry. Um, thank you for agreeing to meet with us on vessel inventory. I think, and I'm hopeful that we can come to agreement on what that true inventory is. Um, I, I'm the one that actually met with your staff and, and identified some ATVs that they didn't have. I will say that while they may have reached out to the ATB operators to verify hours, they're still assuming there's five ATBs out there that are calling California waters at average vessel hours um, of the existing fleet. And we demonstrated in our comments, which is leading into my question, that that's just not true. Those vessels are not calling with anywhere near that frequency. And that's where the overstatement is in your assumption that the unreported vessels are, re, are occurring hours at the same as the average vessels. And that, you know, I just appreciate the opportunity to sit down and finally clarify that. But, but it really brings me a question. You've talked about four things the board's directed you to do, but underlying all this is a lot of public comment was made. Um, this is our fourth, fourth go round of public comment. And I, I know you didn't review all the public comment before you met with the board, or I, or I can't believe you could have gone through it. And, and so my question is that that's still part of the task for, for CARB staff is to, you know, dig through the public comments. A lot of it was highly technical. A lot of what the towing industry submitted was highly technical. A lot of what the sport fishing community, uh, passenger uh, fishing community put forward was very technical. And, and really should be information that's built into the modeling and the tech. So I, I guess my question is, is that, am I wrong? Is that not going to occur or is that not occurring? Or is that still underway? Well, thank you, Scott, for the comment. Um, we do have to respond to all of the comments that were submitted in writing before the hearing and at the hearing and the verbal testimony at the hearing. Um, I'm going to turn that question to Bonnie Soriano to add anything that she thinks we might have missed. Great, thanks, thanks, David, and and thanks, Scott. I we do have we are required to respond to every comment, and you're correct. There was a lot of technical information provided, and you know, in reflected in the meeting yesterday and what we decided to, you know have two follow-up meetings to talk about what you did report and how your conclusions are very different than our conclusions and so we do have a you know we have a requirement to respond um 
and as part of the final statement of reason. And so, yes, we'll be we'll be doing that. But, but also incorporating. Am I am I not correct? I mean, it, it's still the plan to incorporate where you, you, you know, where you find that the comments are actually indeed accurate and worthy of incorporating into the rule. So in in reviewing this, and part of what we review is, does it lead us to a, a different conclusion than what we came from, than what was made originally based on the data that we used in the 45-day package? So to the extent that it it changes the consideration, then then yes, we would bring that to our management and we would decide, you know, what, what are the next steps for that? Okay, thanks, Bonnie. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Michael Myers. Michael, I'm unmuting your microphone so you can speak. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Michael Myers with uh, Centerline Logistics, also a member of the American Waterways Operators. Uh, we provide uh, transportation services for the communities of California, both uh, locally and uh, interstate between uh, the West Coast uh, uh, ports along the coast. And I noticed that uh, you did do a carve out for the commercial fishing fleet, primarily due to some um, you know, profit margin issues and and retrofit uh, feasibilities and um, uh, most of the operations were offshore. Well, that applies to a great deal of the, the transportation that we do in California. We're uh, just hitting the ports uh, inbound for a few days and back out on the ocean again. Why is the uh, uh, offshore coastwise tug trade not carved out like the, the uh, fishing fleet? Uh, thank you, Michael, for the comment and the question. The key difference between the commercial fishing fleet and the other 17 categories of harbor craft is they're not in a strong position to pass costs on to the next user. And that was not something that we were able to identify or determine was the case for the other 17 categories of harbor craft. So they have a requirement that if operating in California waters to upgrade to tier three or four plus DPF, depending on the size of their engine. So, I mean, basically what, you know, I, I have no doubt that we can qualify through a E3, you know, feasibility type extension, but for a towing vessel, you know, a six year, eight year extension is maybe 25% of its, of the asset life, you know, the amortized life. So that's kind of like me telling you back in 2005 that, hey, you know, your house is not uh, meeting the new codes. And so you're going to have to tear it down and build a new house, even though you, you know, you got a 20, 20 year mortgage on it. Uh, coming back 10 years later and saying, hey, oh, by the way, uh, you're going to have to condemn your house again because we just changed the codes on you. Um, so you got to go get another 30 year mortgage and you haven't paid off either one of the first two mortgages. So that's kind of what you're asking the, uh, the, the, all the commercial folks out here, as well as the, the sports fishermen, it sounds like. We hear your comment and thank you for sharing it with us. Okay, our next commenter is William Wilkerson. William, I'm unmuting your microphone. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, good evening. On behalf of myself, b and Sport Fishing, AKA Malahini Sport Fishing Inc. I, I just, I have a comment and then a question. I want to express my concern for, for the proposed uh, California Air Resource Board CARB, Harbor Craft Regulation. Under the amendment, 
beginning January 23rd of 2023, commercial passenger fishing vessels will be required to replace engines with cleaner tiered engines, perform uh, testing and pay annual fees. I've been a fisherman for 30 plus years. I know my colleagues, our communities and the benefits of the challenges of our industry as well. We act as stewards of the land and water, not only for our benefit, but for the benefit of future generations to come. We make this an active choice to bear much of the cost and responsibility of protecting our natural resources. While we value the importance of quality air, we also believe the importance of the three pillars of sustainability, economic viability, environmental protection, and social equity. As the current amendment stands, the regulation is not sustainable, is not a sustainable option. For our industry, it is not equitable for California's and CPF operators. That's my comment. Based on, this is my, that's my comment. This is my question. Based on the new information just heard today that I heard today from Peter from American Waterways about the numbers being skewed, when, to 29% when the true number is 2.9%, why would staff not address this? And I, I why, why was a graph on the 19th of uh, November when the first one I came to showed 150 school buses equals to one uh, sport boat? To me, that that's, doesn't make sense. Can you guys please explain that? I'd appreciate it. Uh, thank you, William, for the comment. And I'll just correct that the, the graphic on November 19th was 162 school buses is equivalent to one tier two engine. Um, that's just an emission factor comparison because the emission controls in the marine sector have lagged behind other source categories. The proposed amendments would mitigate and bridge some of that gap. Um, alluding to what Bonnie Soriano said in response to the comment from Centerline Logistics a moment ago, the we've, we've set up a meeting to talk with the American Waterway operators and their consultant to address and better understand any impacts of the data that they provided in their comment letter and whether it would change the, the best available conclusion. The inventory is a, a document that's evolving, um, it's living. If there is something that comes to light in those discussions that would change our conclusion, we would up, make the necessary updates. However, um, as Bonnie alluded to, we're not gonna make updates to adjust something that would be not impacting the, the bottom line or the, the recommendations from our proposal. But if, if can you guys still hear me? We can still hear you. Okay, if if your analysis is skewed, your analysis is skewed regardless, correct? I'm gonna miss, I, I believe skewed is a mischaracterization. I mean, we, there, there were vessels that had not reported, so we did not have data on them. And we use a number of data sources. This is with any inventory. You don't have information on every vessel. We use, every data source we can find. And I, I have to tell you, my, my team is out there scouring the, for, for data, you know, AIS data, reporting data on where vessels operate, the number of vessels that we get from the US Coast Guard, that we get from Fish and Game, that we, that we find through other sources. Activity, as somebody mentioned, they're not required to have AIS data. We use what we can find for the vessels that have AIS data on them. That's the best available information we have at the time. We take all that data and compile it together. Are there places there could potentially be gaps? We need to fill those gaps in as we get that data. And I think that, and I think that we relied on a number of different organizations within this group to get that information together and fill those gaps where we didn't have information. And that might've been because the vessel didn't report. It might've been because they weren't required to report. 
it might have been because they didn't have AIS data. We took all the information that we could gather, we, we synthesized all of that, and we put that into an inventory. And that represents, at that time, the best data we have. As we get additional data, we fill in the places that we didn't have a data originally. That doesn't mean the data is skewed. It means that we are refining the data. When the when AWO came to us a couple of years ago and said, our numbers are different than your numbers, my staff went through those vessels line by line, called the vessel operators, got information about um, operating hours. And so we did respond to that. Were, are there some vessels that maybe didn't get incorporated all the way? You know, we're talking, I, I heard a number like five vessels. We have an inventory of something like 3,500 vessels. And so we have taken all that data and we have put it together. And I have to say my staff is extremely meticulous and, um, and very aware of needing a very robust data set. And so the characterization of the data being skewed is just inaccurate. Are there places that we could use more data as more data becomes available? Yes, and we will continue to do that. We've made a commitment to AWO to meet with them to try to understand what data they have versus what data we have and what conclusions maybe, or, or what data doesn't quite match. That doesn't mean the data is skewed. It means that maybe there is additional data that we can use to refine the inventory. But the other thing I was mentioning is that these inventories take like a year to do, the health risk assessment, a year to do. I mean, we, we have been working on this regulation for two years and we, when we get data, we can't always just slot it in. I mean, it, it takes a long time of very, um, of very exacting modeling to, to get this information. And so, and so I'm proud of the work that the staff has done. And I just, the, the characterization that the data is skewed, I just have to recharacterize that. Okay, with, with, with that being said, if, if you have numbers of 29%, okay, in, in a certain category, and it's actually 2.9%, could you not just take that 2.9%, replace that 29% to get an accurate number? we would, we, our response to that is that we will, we said that we would meet with AWO. We've all, we're, we're working on that now. And our response to that is we will meet with and, them in and, the net. We're, we're meeting with them both on the health risk assessment and on the inventory numbers. And based on that, we're going to look at those numbers and see what their data, and we will run you know, a sensitivity analysis to see how much we think that that would impact the inventory. We will provide that information to our management and give them an idea of, of, you know, will it change the inventory by 1%? Will it, you know, what, what is going to be the impact? We made a commitment with, with AWO two days ago to do that. And we're committed to doing that where staff is in the process of of pulling that information together and doing those comparisons. Can I ask a, just one more question, if I may? When when was the discrepancy or the, or the difference uh, found? Do you have a timeline for that? I I we have been working with them to update data. I mean, data doesn't always come at at one single day. We've been working with AWO as as David said. They were one of our first stakeholders that we started working with. Okay. Um, and so we have gotten we have gotten information back and forth with them and and I think the partnership has been helpful. There are some areas that maybe we don't necessarily agree or that we didn't have the data or or that we didn't have enough data to incorporate it at the time that we needed to incorporate it. I, so it's an iterative process. It's not like there's one day that um, no, I understand that. They provided that data. us data, and we and we didn't use that data. I understand that data 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 is changing every day because mm -hmm. of the environment. I get that, but okay, 
did I guess I guess the question I'm trying to ask did we did you guys have this information prior to the 19th of November one would be my first question this is David I believe that the the AWO's comment letter that expressed a difference of opinion came in during the 45 day comment period it was one of the 3,000 3,200 comment letters that came in. So, so as we've does, been doing outreach since the hearing and does meeting that with mean, the operators. Does, it, does that mean you had the, the information prior to November 19th? We received AWO's comment letter during the 45 day comment period, which closed before the 19th of November. Okay, so with, with that information, would that not have given you enough time to rework your numbers? To, pre to present a accurate picture to the board? If, if in fact there was an accurate picture. We present to the board, we, the 45 day comment, the 45 day package freezes what we present to the board. We are in the process of taking all those comments, reviewing them and and determining what impacts that they will have. And that is reflected in our final statement of reasons. So we can't yes. run a nine month analysis in three weeks, no. So, no, you did it. Okay, that, that's all I wanted to know. Will, when, when that meeting comes up, uh, I do believe it's the, when? When's the next meeting, January? Or is it um, January? This February is, yeah. or something? You mean the next oh. board hearing? Yes. Yeah, it hasn't been scheduled yet. It's going to be in the spring. Okay. Will will those analysis be brought forward then at that time? We're going to look at what we're going to evaluate this the differences between what AWOs provided and and what we have, and we will based on that we'll bring the information to our management. I don't know what the outcome is of that. I, of what those analyses will be. So I can't tell you what we'll, what we're going to do at this point. Okay. But I mean, if, if to, to me, honestly, to me thinking about this, if, if I'm, I'm looking out for the best possible results for all individuals involved, correct? Is, is that not what we're doing? We are yes, of course. Okay, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt here. Um, okay. So I'm Thank Heather you. Arias. I'm division I'm chief. Heather. All the teams report to me. Um, William, we're we're happy to have this conversation with you offline. Um, you're asking a bunch of questions that the team has not had a chance to look at. They've already multiple times um, indicated that we are having follow up meetings. We can't tell you what's going to be the result of those meetings. Possibly the result of that meeting could be that we do not agree with the assessment that's been provided, and it may not change our data or any of our analyses. But what we are committing to is that if there is new data that we need to update our analyses, we will make sure that our bosses are aware of that. We will make sure that we make that available. At this point, we have nothing more to tell you, and we can't speculate as to what will be the result of those meetings. If you would like, we'd be happy to follow up with you after those meetings um, to give you some more information if that's something that you're interested in and anybody else. But at this point, we cannot speculate as to what the conversations are gonna be with American Waterways. I would like to be able to move on, please, because we've already told everybody multiple times that we need to meet with American Waterways. We need to be able to talk with them. We've already had some initial discussions with them that we believe that some of the numbers that their consultant pulled were the incorrect numbers, but we do want to get on the line with them and be able to uh, compare very specific. If in fact we have errors, we will make sure that we work to adjust those and provide those to our bosses. But at this point, we do not believe that there are any errors. Okay. So if you're, if you'd like to meet with the staff after, please let us know. Otherwise we need to move on. Yes, I would, uh, can I get email addresses? I can email, we can email back and forth. That'd be fine. I yes, appreciate they are, that. they are right here on the screen and in the posted slide deck. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, our next speaker is uh speaker is Regina Su. Um I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly or not. Um I'm unmuting your microphone so you can speak. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, this is Regina Su with Earth Justice. I just want to thank the staff for the update on the technology and implementation review and the contingency measure. Given the massive increase in port pollution throughout the state since the pandemic, particularly around the San Pedro Bay ports, we think that this harbor craft regulation is really critical to alleviating the pollution burdens, particularly on nearby port communities. And I think more action is needed specifically for equipment such as barges and tugboats. Um, we're also supportive of the technology assessment beginning in 2023. This will be important, especially considering the rapid developments in technology and deployment of zero emission harbor craft in other areas of the country as well as abroad. And to meet clean air standards in certain regions of the state, moving to zero emissions for all sectors, including growing sources of pollution such as harbor craft is really necessary. And we agree that technological developments should inform potential future amendments to speed this transition to zero emissions. And I also just wanna echo the need to move forward with this rule as soon as possible and no later than March. And thanks to the staff for all their hard work on this rule. Thank you, Regina, for your comment. We'll take it into consideration. Our last commenter is Max Cohen. Max, I'm unmuting you, uh, so you may speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Max Cohen. I represent Curtin Maritime. We're a tug and barge operator uh, based out of Long Beach, California. We engage in marine construction and transportation services along the coast of California. Um, we, I've also been working with uh, AWO and Peter and, and the other Max who spoke earlier. Um, Curtin Maritime, we take, a, we take immense pride in our uh, aggressive pursuit of fleet innovation while actively integrating best management practices within our current business operations. Commercial harbor craft operations are paramount to our state's ability to properly maintain our waterways and ports, which are crucial to American trade. Additionally, long haul barge transport operations provide grossly overlooked benefits to the general public by connecting commodities to distant markets without congesting California's already strained freeway system. Um, we understand the importance of taking meaningful steps to reducing uh, harmful particulate matter and greenhouse gas emissions uh, within our areas of operations. And um, our, uh, we, have, we have dedicated resources towards researching and implementing new technologies within our fleets. However, the newly proposed C uh, commercial harbor craft amendment promulgates an impractical expansion of existing CHC regulations. This amendment will now include engine upgrade requirements to be met within a time frame that is simply not feasible for subchapter M operators. Um, concerns regarding these additional regulations have arisen based on valid observations of blatant discrepancies littered throughout the new amendment proposal process. Um, I don't wanna beat a dead horse. I just kind of wanted to reiterate some of the AWO talking points and um, you know, the data discrepancies, and I wanted to commend Ms. Soriano for committing to take a look at that with AWO. Um, the one question I did have was um, about the CMA study for compliance extensions. You mentioned uh, that this was going to be, uh, was, was for commercial fishing vessels. Um, I was wondering if this applied to uh, our, tug, our tugs as well, um, due to the fact that this can raise the vertical center of gravity, putting us out of Code of Federal Regulations, and I was wondering if the U.S. Coast Guard had anything to say about that. Well, thanks you, thank you, Max, for your comment and your question. So I heard two parts to your question. One was about the the scope of the streamlining of the feasibility extension. Um, I'm going to ask Melissa Houghton to respond to that, and then I'll just repeat the second part of your question, which was about changes to the center of gravity and how the, that would affect the Coast Guard approval process. Uh, thanks, David. So on the streamlining of the compliance extension process, um, that CMA study would be available for any operator to use to demonstrate lack of feasibility um, for the initial application. 
um, let me know if that answers that question for you. And that's uh, what's what's the extension for the initial application again? Um, so if you're applying for the E3 feasibility extension, uh, you could use that CMA study for the initial um, extension application. And then that application window would just depend on the compliance date for the vessel you're applying for the extension for. Okay. okay. And, and Max, I'll just add, so Melissa uh, said correctly, it's uh, any vessel operator can apply for the extension. Any vessel operator, like public or private, could get the streamlined process. What we're proposing or suggesting today is it would be based on the results of the feasibility study. So unless you have a vessel that didn't have a fitment identified in the CMA feasibility study, that would not mean that every vessel in every category, regardless of fitment and material, would be streamlined. So let's just say, for instance, you have a vessel and it has a challenge, but it was identified as really feasible in the CMA study. There would just be no streamlining, but you could still do your vessel specific analysis, submit it to us along with the financial records and get that extension. Okay, but so if I, if, you know, we did a feasibility or we were able to find that implementing this new technology did in fact raise the vertical center gravity on one of our vessels, we would, that would be a reason for an extension, correct? Or So the technical part is a little bit above my head, but if you get to the point where you can demonstrate there's no way to put a tier four engine and modify your vessel, uh, then that would be grounds for getting the technical component of your extension granted. So if there's a center of gravity problem that's raised and it can't be mitigated in any way, uh, then that would be a way to satisfy the extension requirement. And just a little follow-up question to that, have you guys taken into consideration the population of vessels that that might actually apply to? Um, has this feasibility study kind of accounted for that or is it kind of like what vessels are most feasible for this technology to go into? Yeah, it's a good question because the CMA study picked a representative vessel from, I think it was 13 different vessel categories and they weren't characterized exactly the way we have them in our inventory. Mm -hmm. In the standardized regulatory impact assessment, and that's appendix C1 to the ISOR, we took their qualitative statements like moderate reconfiguration required and then assumed a percentage of the fleet would have to be replaced versus repowered based on that qualitative statement. So there are numbers. I don't have them at my fingertips, but we did assign numbers and they're in appendix C1. Appendix C1 of the, what was that called again? Um, it's the standardized regulatory impact assessment. The uh, SRA, okay. SARIA. Gotcha. Oh, and then, yeah, I just wanted to know if the US Coast Guard had any comments about any of, any of that to you guys, sorry. I'm trying to think about the specifics of the U.S. Coast Guard comment letters. Uh, they may have commented that some vessels would likely need to be repowered or they're, I'm sorry, replaced if repower wasn't possible. Uh, that hasn't been a focus of our conversations where they've indicated that there is going to be challenges with assessing stability once the new engines are in place. They have a process for checking the stability of vessels after new engines are installed. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Thomas Babineau. Uh, Thomas, I'm unmuting your microphone to speak. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, that last question actually uh, was an interesting piece. So my name is Thomas Babineau. I work with Ripos. I'm a silent majority on this call. We're a DPF manufacturer. Um, just to kind of bounce right back to that last question on the center of gravity, um, 
we have two DPFs that were retrofitted in the state of California recently, and the Coast Guard did an extensive study on the center of gravity. <clears throat> and we had to, of course, provide all the numbers, which were done through a naval architect. Um, in this particular case, we were able to replace out the existing silencers. So there's very little change in the center of gravity. But the point being that that is something that the Coast Guard is looking at and is deeply involved with. Um, originally, I wanted to make a comment on three basic areas. One is the safety of DPFs. The second was Coast Guard involvement. And the third is this regulatory process. With regards to safety of DPFs, DPFs have been installed on vessels for a decade. And we personally have over 20,000 hours accrued on DPFs in the state of California over 10 years. And additionally, we have these two new uh, designs that are now in service in the state of California. And we have tens of thousands of DPFs installed out there in various applications. And I've been through this process. I'm one of the old guards with, with some of the other folks here on, on this call. I've been through this six times with the TRU regulation, stationary RTG, APU, off-road, and now Marine. And every time this process is interesting to me, and I'm, I really appreciate the fact that I've been able to sit in tonight and listen to the concerns from all sides. It's very educational for us as DPF manufacturers, and I can assure you operators that ARB is as hard on me as they are on you in this regard. They force us to prove that we can get to a technological feasibility that is going to be safe, is going to be robust, and is going to meet the emission reductions. So with regard to my last point, which is the regulatory process, um, everybody here is in a difficult position. We don't move forward until we understand that there will be a regulation. Although we did start 10 years ago by installing DPFs on vessels in California. And those have proven to be very reliable and very robust, which I think gives ARB some confidence that, okay, this is a possible path. Then additionally, we have to go through the verification process, um, which requires a very rigorous study. Um, I think Bonnie had it right when she mentioned about whether fitment was gonna be the issue or not. I think from our perspective, that's what it comes down to. And what's interesting as a DPF manufacturer is I can count on one hand how many of the operators have called us and said, how big is this? How is it going to fit in my boat? And I understand that there's a lot of the commercial fishing group here as opposed to barges, et cetera. And that is a different animal. And what I've noticed with these six times I've been through these regulatory and uh, efforts with ARB is that they always provide these outs, these off ramps, as I call them, whether they're low use, whether the technical readiness is not there, whether the fitment isn't right. So every time we've been, we being the world, the environment, ARB, the operators have been successful because they tend to hit the right balance between, you know, what is a what is feasible and what is not feasible. So these cost uh, off ramps, these low use off ramps, the fitment off ramps, all these things seem to come into play with every previous regulation I've been involved with. And so I appreciate what you all have done on both sides of this. I think that it's the right tone to be challenging each other to get to the right position. And I thank you for giving me the time at this late hour to express those thoughts. And I would tell David, if any of the operators want to reach out directly to a DPF manufacturer, he's free to share my contact information. I'm happy to answer questions about our experiences in the uh, marine environment with regards to DPFs as it relates to safety or Coast Guard or technological readiness. So I thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Thomas, for the comment. And uh... Um, we'll, we'll pass your contact information along if any operators request it. So Aaron, let's move on to the next 
question. I see some raised hands. We're going to do our best to get through as many of these as possible and, and wrap things up by around eight o'clock if so we don't keep everyone here. So if you have your hand up and you don't need to be called on, go ahead and lower it. Um, we'll prioritize the people who have not spoken yet. So Aaron, back to you. Yeah, thank you, David. Um, I see Richard Smith. Uh, Richard, I'm uh, unlocking your microphone so you can speak. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Rich Smith, and I'm here representing West Arm Marine Services, which is a small family-owned uh, tugboat and barge company and water taxi company in San Francisco Bay. Uh, they specialize in marine construction operations. I just wanted to uh, note, you know, there was a comment made before that the information provided on the vessel inventory um, was provided at the 45-day uh, uh, regulatory comment period. And, and actually, we brought the whole situation of the inventory up about two years ago when we first talked to you and we first saw your uh, proposals. So, um, you know, you folks have known about that for quite a while. So uh, um, we look forward to, uh, to meeting with you and, and going over the details to uh, uh, help sort out uh, uh, what boats are what. Um, other final comment is that uh, we, we support all of the AWO comments. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for your comment. Um, Aaron, let's go on to the next question. Uh, our next speaker is Michael Hoffman. Michael, I'm unmuting your microphone so you can speak. Yeah, hi, good e evening. Can uh, everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. I just had a question concern. I, I believe 100% in the uh, benefits of uh, DPF technology, uh, as, as Rich Smith has pointed out. H however, I am concerned, has anyone or, or has uh, RIPOS uh, by chance considered the uh, <clears throat> application of uh, DPF technology on the uh, warranty effects of uh, of new engines, uh, specifically around the increased back pressure they uh, may cause? Uh, yeah, I can speak to that. Um, having now tens of thousands of DPFs out there, we've never had a warranty claim uh, with regards to engine malfunction due to the DPF. Um, in any case, with you know, without regard to anything, including high back pressure. Uh, we are an active DPF, and that's a little bit different than a passive DPF, where I like to call it smart technology. You know, we have computers in there, and we're monitoring back pressure, and we're increasing regeneration rates to keep back pressure in an allowable range. So, um, you know, the answer is uh, we've been involved in this in a very long time, and that's that has not been an issue. I will also just add that the Coast Guard at present is, I'm gonna use the word monitoring that. Uh, so they definitely have an awareness of uh, back pressure as it relates to DPFs. And so they're looking into this as well. And of course, we're in that verification stage where um, these tests are ongoing and we're all, the goal is to, is to lock all this down by the time these regulations come into play. We have a high level of confidence. We've done it six times. Um, I don't see any reason why we won't do it again. So Rich, you're, you're not aware of any engine manufacturer uh, warranty concerns. And a uh, second part of the question is, <clears throat> uh, I mean, for my benefit, what would you consider the nominal uh, back pressure increase to be? Well, the vessel we're operating right on on right now, our back pressure is at four inches of water column. So I think we're equal to the silencer that we replaced. Uh, so that being said, uh, vessels offer a pretty unique situation with regards to the fact that, you know, you're going to throw a throttle at some point and 
you know, things are going to change just as they do on, in a standard system without DPF. Um, I can't speak to DPFs across the board because we are an intelligent DPF. Uh, but no, nobody's expressed warranty issues or claims. We've never had a claim and we are active technology controlling back pressure specifically. That's how our system works is our number one feedback loop is back pressure. Okay. Th uh, thank you, Rich. I, I think that answers my question. Well, thank you, Michael. And just to clarify, that was Thomas Babineau of Rifos Filters. Uh, I just wanted to clarify the name. Um, oh. Aaron, let's go on to the next commenter. And we do have phone in callers. So let's do a check of phone in callers at this point. Okay. Yeah. Um, most of our phone in callers uh, did not rejoin the meeting after our break. But for those of you who are still on the line, uh, I have uh, mute, unmuted you. So you are welcome to press star six now if you would like to uh, ask a question or comment. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. Okay, hearing none. Um, if you are on the phone and you have been unable to uh, get through, please again, use our contact information, reach out to us. But otherwise, uh, Aaron, let's continue. Uh, with the uh, other comments. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Nick. Um, I see Jerry Allen. Um, I'm muting your microphone to speak. Hey, uh, you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I, I had submitted a couple of questions, but one specifically about DPFs. And since we've kind of gone down that road here, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what this gentleman's been offering. Um, I'm a fleet manager for Class Maritime, and since 1999, I've been <clears throat> running or commissioning low emission tugs. But in the last six years, I've done nine tier four tugs, um, five with SCRs and urea, and four with EGR systems, the GE diesels. So I have a, had the opportunity to work directly with the factory people, uh, MTU, GE, and Caterpillar, because those are the engines we've been using. <clears throat> I reached out to every one of the OEMs at the factory level when this regulation came out. And at this point, unless something has happened in the last month, none of them can predict when these devices will be available and I was cautioned by two of the OEMs that installing anything on top of the EPA tier four systems will make them non-compliant. Now, I know the gentleman said there's not a warranty issue, but MTU clearly told me if we put anything past their after treatment, it was a warranty issue. So I would beg to differ that he's, he, you know, I, I know he's an aftermarket DPF dealer and as is Miratech and others. But um, my question is kind of with the timing here is does or did CARB have insight that we don't have knowing, you know, looking at the vessels that I was involved in uh, from model year 2017 to 2020, which we just finished for tier fours for California, um, that there would be uh, OEM supplying DPF type systems, or was that just a fantasy based engineering question? And we threw it out there. Well, thank you, Jerry, for your comment. And uh, we recognize FOSTA's experience in the maritime sector and also on the, the tier four engine technology as you've already adopted it within your company. Uh, we do recognize that some engine manufacturers and through the the engine manufacturers association have expressed thoughts comments about not wanting dpf technology to be used in conjunction with their engines between the engine block and the scr system the dpf manufacturers that are working with us in an aftermarket capacity through our verification process are focused on proposals that would go downstream of the SCR system. 
Um, from CARB's side, we don't have any information suggesting that we do not have authority to require that or that the engine manufacturers would be able to violate a warranty claim um, if there's a problem with the engine and the specifications were followed. So for example, if an engine manufacturer has a back pressure limit and the DPF installer verifies their platform for that engine and demonstrates that the back pressure limits are not violated, there should be no concern or claim that anything downstream of that engine caused the warranty claim. So if you are installing something on your engine, a DPF to comply with the proposal and there is a concern with the engine manufacturer, uh, please bring it to our attention. Uh, we'd like to work with you to better understand the issue. It's not something that we're aware has caused any concerns at this point. Okay, I understand that. Um, I I still question the fact that you know anything you touch on these and all all nine of these boats have been test engines and to tell you the truth they're still struggling with the SCR systems even now that they are mostly certified not all of them. Um, so uh, you know we we'd like to see. A combination we'd like to see the OEMs and aftermarket you know come up with something here but but at this point it's it seems like the timing of this is is kind of unrealistic you know even if you know we look back and I've been at this since the beginning of the first hovercraft rule uh, you know 15 years to get us to tier four right because 2005 is really when it was written and 2007 it was implemented but uh, it seems like you know having to supply every two years more proof and more proof and you know looking at boats that some of these companies like ours invested many millions of dollars in and seeing that there's a possibility we're going to be changing engines out in 2028 on engine boats built this year i mean can we just keep kicking the can down the road and if that's the case why don't we just change this make the schedule a little more realistic to technology and reach out to the oems and reach out to us I mean, we all want to make improvements, but it, it seems like the, the schedule here for tugs and ferries is is um, is a little optimistic. Yeah, thank you for the comment. Um, we recognize tugs and ferries are in one of those earlier groups for compliance with the extensions. Uh, the compliance dates could run out into the 2030s. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're proposing that technology review every two years. So we'll look at the tier four technology. If for some reason the, the DPFs aren't becoming verified by CARB, if they're not becoming certified by EPA with the engines and zero emission technologies proposing, um, that may warrant revisiting the proposal and coming back to the board under a separate regulatory process. Um, so that technology review will cut both ways, both on the the combustion technology and the zero emission technology. We appreciate your comment. And thank you for your time and staying late. It's nice to knock some of this out. And no problem, and, but we'll take a few more questions here. So Eric, go ahead and go next down the list. Yeah, um, I know it's Jamie Diamond put a few questions in the chat. So Jamie, I'm unlocking your uh, microphone so you can speak. Hi, thanks. I'm starting to feel personal there for a minute. Um, let me just acknowledge, so I, I own Startup Sport Fishing in Santa Barbara Landing in Santa Barbara. Um, I'm gonna acknowledge the privilege and how lucky I am just to own a business in California. Um, not many people get to do that and, and I get to live you know, the life that, that, that I've chosen. Um, I'm also really, really lucky to be part of an industry association that can spend hundreds of people hours researching in meetings, working with government relations consultants, environmental engineers, mathematicians, and PR specialists. With all that on our side, we've still not been able to get all the data requested from you. Even after a meeting with a legislative staff where you said you'd get it to us, and then a week later, you emailed us saying you wouldn't give us the info that was requested. How could any small business owner be expected to navigate all of this on their own? The glaring steamrolling and inequity and lack of transparency have been horrendous. The data we do have has glaring flaws. For example, we now know much of the boat-based data for CPFVs specifically was taken from four CPFV vessels and then extrapolated across the fleet. 
My high schooler statistics class knows this is beyond flawed and negligent. Your use of the phrase best available data is concerning. There is better data. And we've stated that since the very beginning. You remember when we launched this whole effort two weeks into the COVID lockdown. If you were so dedicated to data collection, why have you still not gotten quotes from shipbuilders on the various class of vessels? Commercial fishermen were excluded without any economic analysis. We provided that, including the cost of rebuilding. And it shows that we are in the same grouping as them financially. You cherry pick what the best available data is. You've taken flawed AIS data, but refused to use the actual fishing log data shown where we spend our time, the blocks we're in, whether we're anchored, trolling, or drifting, meaning engines on or off. We'd also like to point out 50% of the CPFV fleet is in San Diego, yet the reductions don't reflect a proportional change going forward with this. I'm appalled by the blatant lies that have been said by several members of your team. For example, one CPFV is equal to 162 school buses. Your own board called BS on that. Have you been, you've also been incredibly creative with how you phrase statements, like the one earlier about the existence of a, T, of a tier four. They don't exist under 800 horsepower for our fleet. And somebody else pointed that out as well. Lastly, a little bit ago, you just stated Coast Guard wrote several comment letters. I believe all written comment must be made pub public. Where can I find these letters? Because I've tried and I can't. Um, I also find it interesting that you had a, that you, that you allowed a DPF uh, manufacturer to stay on and answer questions from other people calling in. I, I, nobody else was allowed to do that. That's that that that's a little puts some mistrust in there. Um, I also don't like how you snapped at Mr. Wilkerson a little bit ago. That was incredibly rude. He he has genuine questions, and I think it was it was it, it was overbearing and the heavy handed the 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 way you guys reacted to him. Um, I just. This meeting, it, it's it's frustrating. I don't feel that you have asked the questions that were emailed in. Um, we still have a lack of transparency. Like I said, you, you you say your data was based on what you had and it was too late to change it. And yet we've told you since the beginning AI, that AIS data is flawed. We've told you the, the fishing game logs were far more accurate. And, and, and you've been putting the onus of data collection on us. This is your job, not ours. So why should we have to give it to you? We've told you where to go get it. We got the quote for, for a boat build. We have, you know, I mean, why should we have to do that? This is your job. You're, you're trying to have us do the work for you to bury our own businesses? No, that's nuts. In no world is, is the way this has been done okay. It's, it's just not, it, there's no transparency. And, and like I said, again, at that second meeting, it's like you guys are acting like toddlers just digging your feet in instead of admitting, hey, you know what? There is another way to do this. Hey, there is other data and it doesn't go the way we want it to, but it exists. I mean, I get that you're texting to each other right now in the chat, whatever. It's just, this is this has been ridiculous. I have a sick kid and I had tonight and all he wanted was mom and I had to put him off so I could sit here and be put off by you till the end of the night. And it's ridiculous what you're doing to people. I've had enough. Well, thank you, Jamie, for your comments. Good to hear from you again tonight. Um, I don't know if you wanted a response to anything, but I, we can move on to the next question. Uh, next caller is Jared Davis. Jared, I'm unlocking your phone so you can speak. Yeah, hi there, Jared Davis again. I made this comment in the first segment. Um, it was kind of pushed forward. Perhaps I was in the wrong portion of the meeting. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing again, but my, my name is Jared Davis. I am a member of uh, a board member of Golden Gate Fishermen's Association, Golden Gate Salmon Association. I'm also the owner and operator of a uh, 49 passenger charter boat in Sausalito, California. Uh, and I provide fishing and whale watching trips to the public on individual fares as well as a uh, 
contract and collaboration with a um, nonprofit uh, ecotourism uh, organization. Uh, my question, in short, was will CARB be updating their economic impact to boat owners? Um, and will CARB reflect the loss of revenue to boat owners from individuals and families that will no longer be able to access the ocean uh, due to not being able to afford our trips, basically? The, um, <laughs> the, the data that you put forward on this one was that, uh, you know, the replacement of our vessels would be possible if we raised our prices by $40 per fare. Um, you know, I think the data on that one is, is flawed as well. Uh, the the uh, actual cost of replacing our vessels with the steel hold vessels, um, you know, could be more around the uh, $5 million price tag. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, that's my specific question, the economic impact, but I, I, I think I wanna jump on the bandwagon here with the, uh, you know, I question, uh, CARB's data. We've heard multiple um, commenters on this meeting uh, talking about, you know, 85% of our time is spent in regulated waters, 2.9% versus 29%. One charter boat equals 162 school buses. Um, 22 tier four engines are available. Um, you know, I just... Um, that the health, the health risk assessment, um, you know, I, I just, I, I, it seems to me that the data throughout this process has been misrepresented at best and, and deceptive at worst. Um, I, I heard Bonnie say that they're working, you're working on refining the data and that's good because, uh, you know, with all due respect, it needs to be refined a lot. And um, I, I also heard her say that it takes a long time to go through this data. And so maybe put the brakes on this thing a little bit and, and wait until the technology and the economic uh, feasibility can catch up. That's, uh, that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Hi, Jared. This is Tracy Haynes. Um, I'm um, overseeing the uh, cost analysis and related documents for the rulemaking. Um, so I'll address your question specifically to the economic analysis. Um, and I'll just say that at this time, we are not planning to um, change the economic analysis as a whole, um, as that was not our uh, one of the things that we were directed to do by the board. However, um, we have been following up with um, stakeholder comments, you know, specific to the cost. Um, since those have been received, um, we are still going through that process to evaluate comments um, and and do follow up research to make sure that um, you know the data that we used in the cost analysis was um, sound um, and that there's no better data um, that you know changes the conclusions of the cost analysis reached that we need to incorporate at this point. Um, so we're continuing through that process. Um, and I also did want to clarify, um, you know, that that the cost analysis does not necessarily assert that, um, you know, CARB believes that, um, you know, businesses can absorb a certain level of, of increase, um, you know, to specific cost, um, you know, that that um, would result um, from the regulation. It's it's simply. Um, disclosure document to to analyze and disclose the cost that would result. Um, so that's what we've done in the, in the cost analysis and the economic analysis. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, you know, I appreciate your your response. Okay, thank you. And I wanted to add one more thing is that, you know, we use very conservative cost estimates. And, and I think that that's, you know, the, the vessel replacement that we're not saying that every vessel, every sport fishing vessel has to be replaced. What we're saying is we're going to use the most conservative estimate, kind of the worst case estimate and say, what happens if everyone has, if everyone has to be replaced. So in that respect, we took a very conservative approach in the costs. And so 
Um, you know, if, so, so we did take a conservative approach and that's why we did that so that, you know, we could be as transparent as possible of, about what those costs would be. So I just wanted to add that on to what Tracy said. I appreciate that, Bonnie. You know, one more point that I would make is that, um, you know, assuming that the um, economics can be sorted through and the funding can be um, procured in one way or another to replace all these vessels, um, Rome wasn't built in a day and boats aren't built in a day. Another caller mentioned this. Uh, the the boat yards the uh, that are available to actually take on a project like that. I mean, we would be very lucky to see all of these boats replaced within our lifetimes. And I'll leave it at that. Well, thank you, Jared, for the comment and I, I also thank you for uh, waiting patiently till we got back to this part. So we're glad that you were able to stay on. Uh, thank you, so David. we uh, it looks like on our end we have five people that have their hands raised still, some of whom have recently spoken. We're going to stay on and get through the rest of the comments or questions. Uh, so Aaron, go ahead and pick up in the queue. Uh, okay, thank you, David. Um, our next speaker is Frank Racino. Frank, I'm unmuting your microphone so you can speak. Hi, uh, thank you for, uh, you hear me okay? Yeah, we Hello? can hear Okay. Hear uh, yeah, thank you for, well, for one, staying on late enough to get all the calls. Appreciate that. But uh, there was some question in uh, these extensions. Do they cost any money? Someone said they, there was like, Fifty or sixty thousand dollars to keep all the extensions going. Is there is that truth to that? So um, I can. Is... Oh, sorry, David. Uh, oh, I go can, ahead, Melissa. I can start, and then you can add if you have more. Um, I was just going to say, there's no cost um, to apply. There's no cost. Um, there's nothing you need to pay to CARB to submit the application. The cost that. Uh, we're referring to or others are referring to is probably related to the um, the analysis you would need to provide like on your financial situation or the feasibility of the tier four or DPF um, being installed. If you have to hire a naval architect or something to perform analysis on your vessel, like that, that would be something that might cost money. So, um, that's part of why the streamlining of the compliance extension we're proposing is for the initial um, application using that CMA study that's already been completed for the uh, technological feasibility aspect of the application can save money so that you don't have to fund your own analysis. I um, got it. Okay. No, that, that pretty much answers it. Uh, and the other thing is what happens after 2034 uh, uh, are the tier fours good then? Is that what you have to have a tier four by then? Or do you have to go something else after that? Um, so when those extensions expire, you would need to be at tier four plus DPF. Um, and so for because the feasibility extension is related to vessel replacement, so those extensions are for if you can't do a repower because it's not feasible and you can't afford a replacement vessel, you could get this extension. When those extensions expire, if the technology has not advanced to a place where you can repower, you would need to replace your vessel to a compliant vessel. Okay, uh, thank you. That pretty much it. And I just want to reiterate that you know having a boat that's paid for already and having to buy one that costs three or four million dollars, the cost to the public is going to be a lot more than forty dollars a person. And if you guys do consider your uh, you know, your emissions, again, if you could look at the time that, you know, the, the power that the engines run at, instead of like saying one power is always 100% when like we run an hour at a 50% power and then the rest of the time we're at 10% power trolling or drifting, uh, I, I would think that would save some, you know, emissions. But 
Thank you for staying on so late. We appreciate it, listening to all our questions. And we're just, just trying to have a future here. Thank you. And thank you, Frank, for your comment and staying as well. Uh, our next speaker is Rick Powers. Rick, I'm unmuting you so you can speak. Rick, you're still on mute. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. <clears throat> yeah, Rick Powers, uh, GGFA. Um, you know, listening to everybody speak this evening, um, I think everybody has voiced our concerns regarding uh, our future. And we just hope that you guys, you know, take into account um, what everybody said this evening. Um, we have taken a path over the years, which we thought um, in order to stay in compliance would help lower emissions. And uh, some of the things you're asking for are just unreasonable. And uh, hopefully uh, hopefully, uh, this, this whole process, um, you, hopefully we can secure some funding hopefully at a state level outside of what has been uh, offered in the past. Um, the Moyer program has been a wonderful thing, but it doesn't help a lot of people uh, depending upon their situation. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Uh, our next speaker is Mark Roast. Mark, I'm unmuting your microphone. Uh, we can't hear you, Mark. You might still be on mute. Uh, we still can't hear you, Mark. Yeah, we can't hear you, Mark. We can come back to you uh, one more time, Aaron. I maybe go on to a different commenter for now. Okay. See, so there's um, two other hands raised. Um, we did get uh, one question in the chat. Um, the question is, did you get a chance to detail for us the technology and implementation review? Can you describe the process for us a bit more fully? Yeah, I didn't hear who that comment came from. Uh, that was from an anonymous attendee. There was a, so the question is, what would the technology and the implementation review look like? Uh, that's a good question. And the, the board resolution might have some specificity in there. We're looking for input on it, but essentially every two years, CARB staff would release some type of communication, uh, potentially a document that would be posted publicly that would discuss changes in tier four technology that relates to the marine harbor craft sector as well as the progress of implementing the requirements as proposed, which for the most part is a cleaner combustion tier four plus DPF standard. So potential things in there may include engines coming to market, number of DPFs that are verified and statistics on percentages of vessel categories that are receiving compliance extensions uh, due to lack of feasibility and that together with the readiness of or any changes of zero emission technology could inform whether changes to the proposal are warranted. Uh, that 
I just want to clarify would be a separate regulatory process. So the amendments being proposed uh, have compliance dates 2023 through 2031 with extensions out to 2035. Uh, the technology review would be something separate from the regulatory process that could trigger the board requesting us to change and come up with amendments to the, the current proposal. Right, thanks, David. Um, uh, I just want to remind everyone, uh, if you don't have uh, any uh, anything additional to add, to please uh, put your hand down. Uh, I'm going to try Mark Rose one more time. Mark, I'm unmuting your microphone. And Mark, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Um, Aaron, maybe you can unmute the other two people with their hand raised just to check them all at once. All right, Jared Davis and William Wilkerson, if you have anything additional you'd like to add, you've been unmuted. Yeah, right, this is Jared Davis. I'm sorry, I just forgot to lower my hand. Okay, no problem. If there's nothing from Mark or William, uh, I believe that's all the attendees. And then Aaron, I know that you've been monitoring the chat, but I just wanna ask for the record for everyone that's still on the meeting, if anyone submitted a comment in the chat that we did not call on, uh, that you'd like a response from us uh, live in this meeting, uh, please raise your hand now and we'll unmute you so you can ask the question, but I, I hope that we got to everyone. So I'm not seeing any more hands raised on my end. So I'll just say that one more time. If there's any final comments before we close, we're going to stay here until all questions are answered. Um, if anyone submitted anything over email they want answered right now, we can do that as well. The Wayne Kotal, sorry if I pronounced your last name wrong. Um, I'm going to unmute you so you can speak. Hi, thanks, thanks for taking this last question. I, I get the answer to my first question, which was, you know, if we put a, a pilot program together and with a type four and we get the funding and put it in and it doesn't work, then what, what would be the compliance and deadline issues going forward? And what you're saying is we get extensions on that. The question I have is other opportunities. If for the majority of our fleet that goes offshore and down south, uh, south of the border, what if they had a hybrid option? Is that a possibility so that they can continue to use their their tier three motors or engines, um, you know, offshore out, outside of, of jurisdiction for this, but then have a low emission or zero emission option while they're in port? Is that an option? Yeah, hi, Wayne. That's a good question. And I think the first thing that comes to mind is the alternative control of emissions pathway. So it's subsection F in the proposed text where any operator or owner can come up with a pathway to reduce emissions in regulated California waters. And we're seeking to maximize zero emission operations where feasible. So for some offshore operation, if it's feasible to operate zero emission within regulated California waters, so 24 nautical miles out and uh, at the Mexico-California border, it's more or less a straight line um, and tier three elsewhere, that, that could be something that we could work with you through the alternative control of emissions process. And there's an application window for that that's in the first three years of the regulation taking effect. So you'll wanna jump on that discussion as soon as our board takes a final action. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Okay, I see Sean A. Bennett. Sean, I'm activating your mic so you can speak. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just really making one comment. You know, we've had, we run Harbor, I'm with Bay Delta Maritime, we run Harbor Tugs in both LA, Long Beach, and in San Francisco Bay, and, you know, run tier four boats. We have a hybrid boat down in LA, the first of its kind uh, running down there. So we have a lot of experience and had a great relationship with CARB and have, have been a benefit of the CARB Moyer funding. And so, um, you know, I, I think one, one point I wanted to make that I think might not be really clear. It's just not really only about warranties, but we also have something called whole machinery insurance. And we recently had a engine failure um, <clears throat> down in Los Angeles and put a claim in for that. And, you know, it was an eye-opening experience, the survey that they did on the vessel, all the maintenance records that they checked, they, te they tested the fuel blend and, <clears throat> and actually were very curious about how much ethanol was in the fuel and it was under under the proper amount. So after going through all of their different efforts, they 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 approved the claim. And you know these engines are a million dollars. So for a small company like us, that could have been a pretty devastating thing if um, if that claim had been denied for any reason at all. And you got to understand these are insurance companies, not to pick on them, but you know they're looking for reasons not to, <laughs> you know, not to not to approve your claim potentially. And so we're going to, you know, just, I, I really just want to emphasize the absolute importance to make sure that the engine companies, um, Caterpillar and, you know, anybody, any, any of the companies kind of are willing to shake their head and say, yeah, yeah, we fully are okay with this. And actually we can then communicate that to our insurance companies to make sure that they're okay with any changes we're doing, including using a biofuels and, and that type of thing, right? And, and blend, different blended fuels, because if it gives them any opportunity or any window at all to then I claim it can be a million dollar cost to a company like ours is, you know, we're, uh, we have six people in our office and 50 mariners in the water, you know, that's a, that would be incredibly devastating. And so we're going to be really, really careful about uh, making changes to, you know, anything that's not fully checked off by the manufacturers. So more point than a question. <laughs> well, thank you, Sean, for the, the comment and the point. And we, we recognize the importance of the the performance of the equipment, the warranties, and making sure that you have what you need. We'll take that into consideration. Okay, back to you, Aaron, for a final check for anyone with final questions. I'm not seeing anyone. Um, Nick, do you wanna try the phone number again? Sure. So uh, we'll try this one more time. Uh, phone caller, uh, I have activated uh, your microphone. Uh, if you'd like to participate, comment, or speak, please do so. Okay, I'm not hearing uh, anything, so uh, I'll say that's uh, concluded then. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Um, that's the end of the webinar tonight. So on behalf of the whole team here at CARB, thank you for staying on. Thank you for your input. We're going to take everything we heard into consideration, and we'll be circling back with our upper management and executive office and returning to the board in spring 2022. So the webinar is as of now over and we are available to take any further questions offline should you have them. Thank you.